Hey, I'm Brad, and this is a brand new YouTube channel. Do I have any idea what I'm doing? Nah, not a clue. Not a clue whatsoever. So, what is Vagabond Discourses, then? I'm actually not even sure yet. After leaving the worldview of my youth, and subsequently leaving the modern atheism movement that took its place, I really still have yet to find a philosophical home where I can lay my head. Of course, at this point I have a pretty good grasp on what my values are, but I'm still awash with competing narratives, and I'm really just trying to figure it out still. So Vagabond Discourses is a project I've started to engage with a number of different people, covering a number of different backgrounds and philosophies, and really dedicating to exploratory language, exploratory dialogue as a means to build bridges through conversation, and more importantly, to eventually find somewhere to land. So today, my guest is Justin Clark. Justin is a public historian and writer based out of Indianapolis. He holds an undergraduate from Indiana University Kokomo in history and political science, as well as a master's in public history from Indiana University Purdue, uh, where his graduate research was focused on Robert Ingersoll and his contributions to Midwestern free thought. Currently, he serves as the Digital Initiatives Director at the Indiana Historical Bureau, which is a division of the Indiana State Library, and he also serves as the co-chair for political education with the Central Indiana Democratic Socialists of America. To say that I was excited to have Justin on would be an understatement. He's been one of my favorite people to follow online for, for quite a while, so it was a bit of a fangirl moment to, to actually have him on, uh, have him on at all, let alone as my my introductory guest. I'm, I'm more than honored. For the first half of the first ever installment of Vagabond Discourses, Justin and I talked about the downfall of modern atheism, how a spiritual practice can be beneficial even as someone who doesn't believe in a higher power, and we close the episode by getting into modern politics and how a modern democracy can ultimately benefit by leaving the red scare behind and allowing space for just a little bit of a Marxist analysis. I hope this was as much fun to listen to as it was to have it. But that's the problem, is that, like, Democrats in this era, they act like such wimps. Like, you need to learn something from the Republicans. They're cocky as hell. You need to get a little bit of that swagger. You need to act mm -hmm. like you got a big swinging dick. Like, you have to have some level of energy, I mean, because they, otherwise... They had the charisma, but they didn't have the stones to back it up. Absolutely. And like yep. that's part of the reason why people hate like Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi, because they're these wimpy, feckless old fuckers like that. People don't like them. I don't like Nancy Pelosi. I don't like Chuck Schumer. I don't like Steny Hoyer. All like these people suck. I tell you what, I am. Super excited for this, <laughs> for this conversation. <laughs> you know, too. when you when you jumped on and said, "Yeah, I'd be totally on board for this." I, you're one of my favorite people to follow on the internet. So, so it, <laughs> of course, uh, forgive me if I go a little bit into fangirl mode, <laughs> because <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. Man. I have God. There's so much I want to talk to you about. Like, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So you're, I mean, goodness, you're kind of all over the internet these days. You've been on a couple different podcasts. You were just on Ryan Bell's podcast. I was, yeah. I forgot. How was that? I haven't had a chance to catch it yet. That was a wonderful experience. I've, I've known of Ryan and of Ryan's work for, golly, you know, probably six, seven years. Um, and so being able to have a conversation with him was just wonderful. It was just truly a wonderful experience to be able to... Um, to share you know a couple hours with him it was it was a lot of fun and it was really great because he and i both have sort of evolved in in terms of how we view humanism and so i think we were able to sort of bond over that and sort of find a way to sort of discuss the for us the interrelationship between sort of how we view socialism and then how we view uh humanism so those two going together for us is kind of a crucial point and so that's something that like we're very big about, and it was really fun to really unpack that on that episode. Yeah, I'm. It's been sitting in my listen later list to to get to eventually. That 
<laughs> I'm I'm excited for it. Oh, I always have uh, my my listen list is forever long. I totally understand. Mm-hmm. Goodness, I've I've stopped driving lately for work, so mm-hmm. my, my list of podcasts to catch up on is growing exponentially. It seems. Likewise, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've been on Plato's Cave podcast, which has been fun to listen to. Uh, the what a year ago you were on the Skeptic Studio talking about uh, the history of American atheism. Yeah, yeah, I did do that. Wow, yeah. that was a while back. Yeah, for sure, that was a good yeah. one. That was a good one. I caught that one. Oh, maybe six or so months ago, and it was that was great, really interesting. Thanks. Uh, the the blog that you write, I know it's not super active, but there's been some things on there that I've read recently that I really want to pick your brain on. Like, <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I don't write as much as I'd like to. Uh, part of it is laziness. Part of it is a mix of like um uh decision like decision anxiety of like okay mm-hmm. which one do i want to finish so i have like multiple ones started and then i just sort of need to get back and just really like be more consistent with it but yeah yeah i i fall into the same boat i started uh, a small blog channel like two or three years ago and i've got all of maybe a dozen entries on it and haven't <laughs> touched it in so long it's it's just there's so much else happening and so much else that i want to do it just never Never gets off the ground. Absolutely, um, yeah. But goodness, you wrote one on Slavoj Zizek and capitalist Buddhism uh, yeah. that <laughs> you talked about his comparison between uh, Western Buddhism to a fleshlight, which I found hilarious. So, <laughs> so I, I think eventually I want to pick your brain on that one a little bit more. Sure, sure, sure. But the the one that really uh, struck a chord with me was your more recent one on Kierkegaard and anxiety. Like Thank that, you. goodness, that one spoke to me. Like, uh, like I, I too, I, I tend to think of uh, my own reality as an agnostic person through spiritual language. So, so seeing how you, who I, I tend to to think is more of an agnostic type of individual, anyways, using spiritual language and language of of Buddhism and the language of Kierkegaard and sin and and tying it all together into just the human experience in general, like I've I've sort of changed my own mind on this in a way over the last couple of years. Uh, I was a very angry atheist for a while, but now I see a lot of value in spiritual language, and I see that a lot of um, a lot of the more deep theological thought is really a, an exploration of the the innermost self and an exploration of. Uh, our connection with the earth and the universe around us and our interconnection via relationships. Uh, so that, that Kierkegaard piece just, just struck me uh, immensely. So I wonder if you want to talk about that a little bit more. Sure. So, so yeah, I'm with you. I think that, you know, I identify as an atheist, secular humanist and, 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 but I, like you, I sort of had a, a sort of change of heart about how to use religious language um, because I think that I fell into sort of the normal pattern of sort of the, you know, for lack of a better word, a fundamentalist atheism, right? Oh, yeah. So it's, so it's the atheism of somebody like a Richard Dawkins or a Sam Harris, um, you know, the Four Horsemen Hitchens. And for a long time, that was kind of how I identified. And interestingly enough, it was one of those four that led me out of it, which was Sam Harris. So... My, I don't really, I don't really engage much with his work anymore. I think he's kind of gone off the rails, but the last been a bit of a disappointment lately. Yeah. Yeah. But I think the last book that he wrote, uh, waking up, um, a guide to spirituality without religion is quite a good book. I think it's actually probably his best book. I think Harris is at his best when he's writing about the interrelationship between, um, sort of humanism and psychology with, with religion and with spirituality and, and particularly when he's talking about Buddhism and the Vipassana tradition, which he writes about specifically, I think he's at his most poetic. I think it's, it's also clearly like a, a field of, of study that he actually knows rather than like Islam, which he's completely ignorant of, but yet, yes. Yes. but yet speaks voluminously about, but he actually has quite a bit of knowledge about Buddhism and particularly And so through him, I found a writer named Stephen Batchelor, who I really, really like. Um, And he wrote a book called Buddhism Beyond Beliefs. 
um, which I really, really like. And there was this, there's this whole sort of subset of Buddhism that's dedicated to a humanist interpretation of it. So there's people like Stephen Batchelor. Mm -hmm. There's another guy named Steve Hagen, who I really like. Um, he's written a book called Buddhism is Not What You Think, which is a wonderful book about how we can use some of the central ideas of Buddhism, uh, particularly the, the concept of awareness and being present um, in a way that doesn't come with sort of religious language and baggage. Um, but so that's really what kind of changed me was that I really got interested in Buddhism um, and I got very interested in um, ways of talking about spirituality that were not related to the supernatural. Because I don't believe in the supernatural. But I do think there's a way of talking about spirituality and religion and religious language that can be incredibly rewarding and engaging. And so that was what I did with Buddhism, and then that's what I did with Kierkegaard. Now, Kierkegaard is sort of the godfather of existentialism, right? So he's a school of thought that comes out of the, the late 19th century into the early 20th century. It's probably most embodied by people like um, Jean-Paul Sartre, um, Albert Camus, mm -hmm. uh, Ralph Ellison here in the United States. Um, but it had sort of progenitors, people who sort of set up the mm -hmm. stage. And a few of those were um, uh, Arthur Schopenhauer, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, and, and then, of course, Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard, of all of the existentialists, what sort of makes him interesting is that he's the religious one of the group. Most of them are non-religious. So Nietzsche was an atheist. He, you know, uh, famously wrote a book called The Antichrist. Um, Sartre was an atheist. Um, Camus was an atheist. Like they were, but and, but Kierkegaard wasn't, and he saw existentialism as a path to faith. And so, in the early 1840s, he writes a book called. Um, the Age of Anxiety, which is this treatise that he sort of writes. And, and back in, in when Kierkegaard was writing most of his work, he wrote with pen names. Um, and I can't remember the exact pen name because it's in Danish or it's either in Latin, but it basically translates to um, citizen of like of, Dan of, of, of Denmark or citizen of the Netherlands or something like that. But he um, but he basically sort of writes about this idea that um, anxiety is sort of this tension between uh, who we are as, as sort of sinful people and what we want to be. And, 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 and so he sort of talks about how those inner relationships really create tensions which create anxiety within us. And the way to sort of combat that anxiety is to sort of cultivate a sense of faith. And what he means by that is in his particular context is a faith in Christ, is a faith in, in Christianity. But I think if you if you read it broadly in a secular way, I think there's a way of reading Kierkegaard where it's basically um, commitments to ideals, where you, because one of the, the sort of canards of sort of uh, radical or sort of uh, outspoken atheism is that like, oh, well, we don't have faith. Well, that's bullshit. You mm -hmm. do. You know, you know, you just have faith in different things. Um, and you use faith in a different way, right? So like, if we're defining the word faith as like belief without evidence, then yeah, I don't have faith. Okay, but if we're defining faith as something like oh, uh, like a practice, yes, yeah, yeah. If we're thinking of it as a practice of becoming, right? So if you're mm -hmm. thinking about it as the potentiality of experience, the potentiality of moral judgment, and the potentiality of a good life, and it's a dedication to those potentialities, that's a version of faith I can get behind because it, it, it's. It's not tied to like specific things that we believe or not. Um, and, you know, I think when it comes to the way that Kierkegaard writes about anxiety, he writes about it, interestingly enough, even though he's writing in the 1840s, he writes about it in very modern terms. He, he reads very modern in a lot of ways because he's constantly having this tension within him between the sort of uh, pain and sadness that he feels as a living human being versus the sort of potential hope and optimism he feels about um, matters of the divine. So he's he's constantly having that tension between sort of having one foot in the material and one foot in the spiritual and, and how it plays out. Um, and he sort of ties anxiety to the concept of sin and what he calls hereditary sin, which is different than original sin. Um, hereditary sin is basically like the sin of you know, it's the sin of the species rather than sort of like the spin, sin of the individual. So 
we're we have sin by virtue of the of those who came before us but we're not born with it originally it's it's a pride product of people before us and the choices that they make right and for me the way i sort of read that is that sin is basically things that harm us you know bad you know bad uh actions bad beliefs bad practices things that harm you and so you know for a lot of people i think anxiety is that tension between wanting to sin wanting to basically do like the short term what quick fix can i get you know what you know what uh what alcohol can i drink what drugs can i take what sex can i have what gambling can i do like there's there's sort of short term sins versus sort of long term uh, goals which are tied to faith so you know whether it's, it's like a, it's like the the cult um like a transactional kind of appeal to it like mm -hmm. i want to get out of this so i'm going to spend my anxiety dollars on on this quick fix where i whereas i could be investing it in something more long term exactly right and so for kierkegaard specifically that's about cultivating um, a, a sort of living practice of, of Christianity. Now, I think, interestingly enough, I think Kierkegaard's Christianity is very u unique in that... From his, what I know of Kierkegaard, I, I would agree with that. Yeah. And that he's not, like, faith... And this is very... This is where he's sort of... The existentialism really comes in, is that for Kierkegaard, faith is an active process. It's not something like, oh, I believe in Christ, I'm done, which is how a lot of people tend to read faith. It's like, I don't... It doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter who I am, as long as I believe. Right. It, it's, well, that, it's that certainty where, okay, I yeah. believe in this thing that I can't be certain about, but I'm giving it my, my certainty without warrant, and that's my faith. Exactly. Whereas... Kierkegaard is more like, no, faith is an active process which requires you to be active in life. And it requires you to have an active and participatory experience with a belief system. And so it's not just believing in Christ, but living as Christ, right? So that's where he's very different. Um, and that's a tension within Christianity that goes all the way back to the founding, right? That whether it's deeds versus beliefs. You know, it's the Paul versus James, right? James is Jesus' brother, Paul. You know, James was all about, it's all about good works, and Paul was like, nope, it's just about faith. Well, for most of Christianity's history, Paul has won out. But there are radicals who tend to go the other route, and, and Kierkegaard is one of them. So, you know, to him, it's about cultivating a living like Christ rather than just simply believing in him, right? Now, we can have, now we can have quarrels about, like, reading Christ, right? Because, like, Christ can be a very contradictory figure. There where are he's so like, many yeah. different ways to read what Jesus is. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, on one breath, he'll say, turn the other cheek, but then, like, in the other one, he'll say, I come not bearing peace, but a sword, right? So, like, Jesus is all over the place. Um, but I think I read Jesus, t I, tend, I tend to read the figure of Jesus in the Bible very similar to how Bart Ehrman does, the biblical scholar, where it's, mm -hmm. Jesus is an apocalyptic prophet. And, and he was one of a, a pantheon of, of, of apocalyptic prophets at, the, at that particular time in history. So he and, was one of many. And, and when you look at the, the tradition of, of prophetic actions, like even in the Old Testament, the prophets were, they weren't speaking necessarily about spiritual things per se. They were talking about the, the plights of their society and how to overcome those. Uh, and not necessarily in a, a spiritual lens per se, but like, okay, we're we're doing a lot of harm to these folks, or these folks are doing a lot of harm to us. How do we get beyond that? Mm -hmm. And sometimes that ends up being interpreted through the lens of a deity, but other times it's like, okay, we need to change our course of action. Yeah, and and and, and that is particularly the case with with Judaism too, where you know, Judaism definitely has its more of its feet planted on the ground. And within even the early church, obviously, you have the divide between, um, you know, the, those who sort of go with faith and those who, who mere belief and those who go with action. But there's also another divide that happens in the early church between the rationalists and the Gnostics. So you have the rationalists who, then they went out and, and they're the ones who sort of say, no, there's a, you know, we can gain re reasonable knowledge of God. And here are sort of the logical proofs we can set about God. And, and this is where you get into Aquinas and the sort of Aristotelian influence. Mm -hmm. But then there's this whole other branch of Christianity and religious thought in general, which is Gnosticism, which is that instead of like trying to sort of logic logically prove out religion, 
you leave within it a certain level of mystery and ambiguity and an enigma um, and that it's about sort of direct revelation. Um, and so you had the, you know, so you had some of the Gnostic thinkers, you know, somebody like Justin the Martyr. Um, and, and so it's more about a direct relationship with knowledge that comes from an outside source, right? Um, and, you know, Gnosticism is that perennial debate. Again, it's those great sort of dualities, right, of Plato and Aristotle. Plato being the, the one who points to the sky in, the, in that great painting, in, you know, in the, in the Sistine Chapel, in the Vatican, rather. You know, Plato, Plato and Aristotle are in the academy, and Plato's pointing to the sky, and Aristotle is pointing to the ground. And there's the, that's the fundamental sort of divide within Western philosophy and Western thought, which is this idealism versus materialism, right? And, you know, I side on materialism, but I do think idealism has its place. And I think that's when you can sort of get into um, uh, Hegel and dialectics and whatnot. And I'm kind of going all over the place here, but yeah, totally fine. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, this is the divide, right? And so like, to sort of bring it back to Kierkegaard, I mean, I think the big thing about him is that again, he, he, and I don't know, I don't know if it's accurate to say that he was influenced by Spinoza or not. But it, it, I would assume he might have been, because Spinoza's idea of God was very sort of amorphous, sort of everything was kind of God. And Kierkegaard kind of has that view, too, where God is this sort of mysterious thing we don't really know, but we have some idea about. Um, but Kierkegaard is way more interested in, like, how are you going to live? If you are a Christian, how do you live as a Christian? rather than how do you believe as a Christian. And this comes, and, and interestingly enough, probably the existential writer, existentialist writer that Kierkegaard had the most influence on um, was Sartre, who was an atheist. And, but, and Sartre asks the exact same question, but as an atheist, how does one live without belief? And how does one live without God? And how does one live actively and triumphantly without God? And that's sort of a pillar of his thought too. It's, so again, it's a philosophy of action, which is, I think, counter to what people tend to think about with existentialism. They tend to think of like sort of brooding people and turtlenecks, sort of smoking and whatever. <laughs> but actually, no, it's a it's an active philosophy that engages with reality, right? Whether you're religious or not. So that, that's why I found Kierkegaard to be incredibly rewarding to read and to write about. Yeah, and and in a similar vein, more more modern writers. Uh, I like to engage in Christian literature still, even though I don't maintain a Christian belief any longer. And after I departed from my my faith, I actually found an author called Richard Rohr, who is a Franciscan monk who has a lot of existentialist leanings uh, and has a lot of Kierkegaardian influences, I mm -hmm. am assuming a bit, but it is of the Franciscan order, and Franciscans are... are not necessarily influenced by Kierkegaard because they're pre-Kierkegaard, but they sort of wrap it in there. And he wrote a book recently, I think end of last year, called The Universal Christ, and he's doing a lot of conversation about what what sin is. And sin to him is, is like you had mentioned Kierkegaard saying earlier, that sin is more of a a, a societal holistic thing. It's the, the actions that we as a society allow to happen that harm other individuals that we may not, may not even be aware of, uh, like systemic racism would essentially be a, a, a societal sin, and that's how Richard Rohr sort of views the sin as views the sin as of the collective. Yeah, um, you know, I I think that's very interesting. And again, yeah, that's it's that that sense of um, a systematic structural analysis, which is I think in, incredibly important um to theological questions because one of the things i think that people get tripped on a lot tripped up about a lot particularly people who sort of are in this sort of like mainstream atheism is that they kind of read religion the way that, that fundamentalists do they don't mm -hmm. they don't tend to read it the way most people actually read it which is that they sort of have it up for interpretation. Some are, some of these some of these things are historical facts. Some of these are moral parables. They're homilies. They're mm -hmm. not. Most people don't read the Bible cover to cover as if every little jot and tittle of it was real. Most people don't do that, even if they are Christians and even if they believe in certain fundamental ten, tenets of the faith. 
And so I think one of the most important sentences that I think about all the time when discussing religion is religion is more than the sum of its beliefs, which is something that modern atheists do not understand. It, it, it's something that, and I think a part of it is that we live in a culture, and, and this, this kind of framework I get from a, a writer I like named Michael Brooks, we, we tend to do two things. We either tend to naturalize something where we tend to sort of overly explain it with science and that sort of does away with the mystery. We mythologize it and that we sort of build these myths to try to understand everything. But instead, we, which those two have their place, but there's one that we tend to leave out a lot, which is historicizing things. And as an historian, that's important to me, that we put things within proper historical context, that we understand the historical, sociological, economic, political, and, and social contexts in which things developed, right? So Christianity comes out of a very specific historical context. It comes out of the, you know, it comes out of the Roman, the late, sort of the, the early Roman Empire. It comes out, it's a religion primarily of the poor. It is a religion of, of instead of many gods that you give subscription to, it's one. But then it gets more complicated with Christianity where it is one God, but then there's Christ who's also God, and then there's the Spirit, who's also Jesus, who's also God, right? So there's like the pagan influence of it. Mm -hmm. um, there's Zoroastrianism in it, which is sort of a precursor to Christianity. These are all the things you have to understand to realize that religion is more than just what people believe. It's, a, it's also a set of practices. It's a set of moral precepts. And whether you agree with them or not, I mean, there's many things about Christianity that I disagree with. It's why I'm not a Christian. But there are ways of interpreting Christianity that I think could be valuable. The I one, absolutely agree. Yeah. And the one that I always go back to, a person I'm incredibly, I admire tremendously and respect tremendously is Cornel West, the, the yes. um, African-American mm -hmm. intellectual. And he talks all the time about pr prophetic, spir uh, prophetic spirituality, prophetic Christianity, where, you know, those who sort of get so hopped up on beliefs all the time and are obsessed with beliefs are missing the broader point of what Christianity is supposed to do, which is that it's supposed to be a toolkit for action. And this is where he gets the influence of liberation theology. Mm -hmm. um, and so Cornel West's real ideal is that you use Christianity as a tool to push forward moral and social progress, which I think is a great way of framing it, right? It's a sort of a Christian humanism. That's what we I do as a humanist. I have a sort of humanist theology that I've developed, right? We can call it whatever you want, but essentially it's a theology. And so... You know, that's a way I think of interpreting religion that is important and, and that could be engaging and worthwhile. And I think that the biggest problem with a lot of sort of modern atheists in the way that they write about religion, they don't really know anything about it. And so they're 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 constantly sort of playing with sort of cheap, easy examples of like, oh, look at this crazy shit in the Bible. Well, well, mm -hmm. no shit. There's crazy stuff in the Bible. There's crazy shit in any book. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, well, that's sort of the plight of modern-day atheism is because it sort of coexists with modern-day American Christian fundamentalism. And and because American Christian fundamentalism views the Bible through a very particular lens, a lot of the atheists who come out of that tend to view it through that same exact lens. And I, I fell victim to the same thing. Like, I watched a lot of atheist experience and, and Matt Dillahunty, and he, uh, he ended up you know, it changing my mind towards modern day atheism and influenced a lot of my views until I started expanding my own circle of influence and realizing, holy shit, he's actually kind of wrong on a lot of different things here and is missing the broader picture of how how spiritual language and, and language of faith in general can be beneficial. We don't have to have uh, such a a hard grasp on on skepticism and a hard grasp on naturalism there there's more to life than just what what we can see and touch and i think that gets lost a lot in the conversation with modern atheists yeah and ironically enough they end up sort of rejecting interestingly enough the way that re that atheists tend to talk about religion is not particularly materialistic it's actually very idealistic they're sort of obsessed mm -hmm. with the beliefs and they don't think about like, well, what are the real material conditions of people who believe in Christianity? Why do they believe what they believe? And engaging with them and asking them why, or like asking them what community they come out of, what political tradition do they come out of, what social tradition do they come out of? Mm -hmm. So that's where religion, I think, gets a lot more complicated. 
I again, it's it's the reason like I don't know. It's it's interesting. Like my atheism has not like my lack of belief in God has not changed over the years. But the way I view that and the way I get to that has changed a lot in the sense that I I don't have an animosity towards religious people anymore. Not really. The only time I really have animosity towards religious people is when they want to force their beliefs on others. Mm -hmm. So it's like people who don't vaccinate their kids or deny children blood transfusions or, or medical care or want to ban the teaching of evolution or want to infiltrate government. Those are the kinds of things they don't like. And, and I don't, and to me, you know, a lot of that, like, yes, they genuinely believe in Christianity, but for me, a lot of that shit is a cover for power. And I think it's important that we understand that like people are using an ideology for power, right? It's the mm -hmm. same thing with like ISIS. It's using the ideology of Islam to sort of per perpetuate a political, a very specific, narrow political interpretation of a religion in order to pursue a geopolitical material uh, uh, goal. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important. Like Sam Harris does this all the time where he divorces discussion of religion completely from real material conditions of people and how they really live and how they really interact in real life with their beliefs. He sort of talks about them consistently in the abstract and then doesn't really get to the bottom. And so he'll create these sort of thought experiments where he'll literally paint the person he's sort of critiquing as being the most nuts. And so whatever position he holds looks reasonable compared to what he, what experiment he's developed, which sounds absolutely batshit. And that's where it's really sloppy thinking. And it's, it, it's a historical thinking. Yeah. And I'll tell you with the, with the whole idea of, of talking about not divorcing people's religion from how they live day to day. So I used to be in the Navy and I didn't go anywhere specific. It was kind of a boring time it, at the end of the day. But uh, one thing I, I explicitly remember, because it, it had really a, a profound effect on on the way I think about things, and and really I think was the 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 catalyst for me eventually beginning to question my own faith. But uh, we used to pass around videos through the intra navy email all the time of ju just some horrible shit sometimes and uh there was a, a reaper footage that i had come across my email where they it looked just like csgo like a video game where they dropped a bomb on the village in iraq or saudi arabia somewhere, somewhere. i don't remember where exactly but almost immediately, like once that bomb went off, like their practice over there is what once once somebody is dead, you need to bury them immediately. And once that bomb hit, there was a flood of people that came through, drug out the bodies, and and essentially had a funeral for them right there, and put them in the ground. Like that instant, and and just that moment for me was really eye opening. Like holy shit, like. We have this this ideology within our own framework of Americanism, of exceptionalism, of, of military prowess, that sort of thing, that we just treat these people like they're not they're not actually humans anymore and we're just blowing shit up. And when you see that happen, you're like, holy fuck, like that that changed me. Uh, just seeing the the nature of their their own faith tradition in their own humanity uh and, and to, to think about how people just divorce that in conversation is is a bit frustrating <laughs> now because a lot of conversation even within christianity itself is is divorced of of the other it's very uh it's very dehumanizing like it's very transactional and it is humanizing yes and i think that I mean, this is the consequence of talking about, you know, uh, a billion and a half people around the globe and sort of a monolith, which, mm -hmm. you know, people like Sam Harris do. Um, and I harp on him because he's particularly moronic on this, is that it's he again, it's when you talk about religion in the abstract and then when he really says horrible shit, which doesn't really hold up to scrutiny. And then he can sort of back off and say, well, I'm not talking about people. I'm just talking about beliefs. Well, mm -hmm. 
who holds beliefs? People do. So it's like, no matter, so when you're talking about beliefs, you are still talking about people because people hold beliefs, right? Beliefs just don't exist in the ether, just floating around, right? They're yeah. a product of people who live lives. It, and it's so, the same sort of shtick that he pulls with when he's talking about race. Like he had that oh, recent totally. podcast on on racism in America and he, he talks about, uh, you know, race and crime as a monolith that happens within the black community and, and divorces it entirely from people. Yes. And he and, does it all the time. And ironically yeah. enough, that actually makes him more religious than some religious people. It does. Like Sam Harris is not a rational materialist thinker. He is an idealist. He thinks about everything in the abstract. It's, and it's a way for him to say what, what would be really truly disgusting if truly just said explicitly, but he sort of says it in this sort of like bullshit, ethereal sort of like thought, again, thought experiment kind of way. And they're not really thought experiments. You know, this is something Michael Brooks writes about in his great book about sort of people like Harris and Jordan Peterson. He says like, Harris isn't actually putting together thought experiments. Thought experiments are things you think about to provide you with some kind of like moral quandary, like, right, like the trolley problem or the prisoner's dilemma. These are thought experiments that help get you to understand like the nature of, you know, complex moral questions. What Sam Harris is really doing is just positing a crazy fucking scenario that you then have to like, like, like in this, in the end of faith, um, which is a truly atrocious book, um, in the end of faith, he has this, ex this example where he uses about, you know, imagine if Al, you know, the Al Qaeda had the bomb and it was in LA and we needed to get to it. And he uses this sort of radical thought experiment, this thing, which would never, ever really ever happen. It would never, ever happen. Right? Like it's so divorced from reality, but it's his way to be able to justify torturing someone. Mm -hmm. That's the way he gets to do, to, to basically justify torture. And so, which I don't think torture is ever justified. And, and, and I don't, and, and, you know, routinely, and again, this goes back to him not actually like engaging with reality. If you actually talk to a lot of people who work in the national security state, they will tell you torture does not work. It <laughs> does not work. Um, and when it does, it gets you very flimsy information because sometimes they're just lying to you. So you stop torturing them. Mm -hmm. Like torturing does not work, but he will ignore that in light and so develop these sort of scenarios in order to basically make his position look reasonable when it's absolutely nuts. And that's really the problem is that like, he is such a reactionary right wing character, but, pa but parades himself around as well. I'm just being reasonable. And that's what these people do all the time. I call, I call it the cult of reason. There's a difference between being actually reasonable and what these people do, which is use reason or rationality or logic as a weapon to silence anybody who disagrees with them. So that's like the problem with people like Ben Shapiro has the same problem. It's like destroyed with facts and logic. It's like, well, he's not really using facts and logic. You're just saying that because it gives you the veneer of sort of, of respectability. It's kind of like when Deepak Chopra uses scientific terms to describe <laughs> his sort of spiritual yep. gobbledygook, right? Mm -hmm. It gives it an air of legitimacy it wouldn't have otherwise. These guys are doing the same thing on the other coin, other side of the coin. Yep. Well, you had mentioned uh, something about Sam Harris essentially uh, posing false thought experiments. And what he's doing really is just framing it in a rhetorical way to bring somebody over to his way of thinking about things. Like, it, it, all it is is a rhetorical debate trick than it is yep. actually uh, a reasonable position. It, it reminds me a lot of... Um, I, I did a lot of following of the street epistemology movement for a while. I and did too. Yeah, I yeah, read that book. Peter Bogosian. Yep. And, um, and he went off the rails too. Most of these oh, people yeah. did. They all went oh, off yeah. the rails. But and, anyway, please, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, who's, who's the guy? Anthony Magnabosco. Yeah. So, so Peter Bogosian and Anthony Magnabosco. I, I think Anthony's generally probably a, a fine guy from what I can see He seems like a decent about dude. Him. But, but Gojian strikes me as being a colossal asshole. But exactly. Yeah. yeah. I goodness. I I recently got back on Twitter uh, after uh, about a year and a half long hiatus, and I had used to follow uh, Peter Bogosian, and I started seeing his tweets. I'm like, what the hell is happening with Peter yeah. Bogosian? Like that. There's some insane stuff coming out of his 
<laughs> out of his mouth. Yeah, there are a lot. There are a lot of people who like at first like, oh, they're great, and then no, they're actually horrible. Mm-hmm. Like Gugosian's one of them. Uh, Michael Shermer's one of them. Oh yeah, uh, Michael who Shermer. I, I've lost entire confidence in. Like. Yeah. <laughs> well, and 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 it's also like the elephant in the room with him is that he has multiple credible sexual alle- sexual assault mm-hmm. allegations against him too, which mm-hmm. no one wants to talk about. Um, I'm surprised that in this sort of climate that he has not really gotten truly like has been held accountable for any of it, but he hasn't. It's very weird. He must have the best legal team imaginable. I I also imagine because as a, as a household name, his name is fairly forgettable. Like no one really knows. Yeah, no one knows who he is outside yeah. of, you know, the people in the know, like he's got his own circle where he's popular, but outside of that, but anyways, my point with the uh, um, the whole street epistemology movement is that it kind of does what Sam Harris and his thought experiment things were doing, is they frame their questions in such a way as being the logical and reasonable way to think about things when what they're actually doing is steering somebody towards their own ideology mm-hmm. without taking into account, uh, you know, the the other ways of viewing the same facts, the same sort of questions yet through a different lens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, that's, that's where I feel like the whole thing is a bit of a grift. I mean, and that's just kind of like my opinion. I mean, I was involved in the atheist movement, like directly as an activist doing work in that movement from 2015 to about 2018. Okay. So I did it solidly on and off for four years. I was involved in it. I used to be involved with um, uh, uh, an online organization called Philosophical Atheism. And then I used to be involved with the Amer- Atheist Alliance of America. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I left that and then started my own organization. But by 2018, I really just got to the point where I'm like, I don't want to do this anymore. I just want to talk as me. I'm tired mm-hmm. of like having to be like the atheist guy. Like I don't... And it had sort of run its course, like the atheist movement by two or three years ago. I mean, post Trump, the atheist movement went to shit. I mean, and 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 it really sort of like exposed that like the sort of broader atheist or skeptic movement. I put those in quotes mm-hmm. for those who are listening to this audio, um, because true skepticism is not right wing reactionary bullshit. Uh, is is that you know it became this sort of cesspool of people who were like, like, uh, you know, racists and rape apologists mm-hmm. and, like, and just like, why are the atheists repeating Stephen Molyneux talking points? Like, why is that? Why, yeah. <laughs> why are, why is the atheist community so obsessed with people like Ben Shapiro? I mean, that was really the shift for me with Harris was when he had Ben Shapiro on his show. Mm-hmm. That was the or infamous Peterson. intellect. And yeah. Peterson, right? So, like, Peterson is a great example of, like, <laughs> Peterson is one of those interesting characters because, like, what he's trying to do on the whole is right. The way he's doing it is wrong. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the point. Like, there are more interesting people to read who are doing what he's doing. So, like, or what he's attempting to do. Like, so, some like, a person like Ken Wilber is a much more interesting writer to to oh, read i don't know that name i'm gonna have to write that one down so ken wilbur is a really interesting dude he, he, the book that's probably the best intro to him is a, is a book called a brief history of everything so ken wilbur is one of those guys who like he's basically just like a more interesting better thought out more engaged just more empathetic version of jordan peterson mm. um He's Jordan Peterson if, if Jordan Peterson wasn't a right wing crank. Um, and <laughs> OK. And and uh, but Ken Wilber has this interesting thing where it's this interrelationship between sort of psychology, particularly psychoanalysis and Jungian and psychology mm-hmm. with Buddhism, with religious traditions and then with sort of a broader humanism. Right. So he's integrating all of these together. Now, do I agree with all of his metaphysical claims? No. But like Ken Wilber's doing something interesting. Right. And he's mm-hmm. one of those guys who's doing something like that. Uh, you know, Scott Atran is another person like that, that Michael Brooks has written about. Um, there are people who are doing that kind of work with religion that's interesting. Peterson is not one of those people. 
Peterson is one of those people who is like, he's got the patina of respectability and intellectualism when in reality he's a nutcase. Mm -hmm. And I think it's like, and, and at the end of the day, what he's really using all of this interesting stuff to do or what he's trying to do is to justify existing social systems which oppress people. Yep. And, yep. and, and it's, so it's like, you know, at the end of the day, like, all of his intellectualism and all of his sort of like William Jamesian will to believe shit all breaks down to I want women barefoot and pregnant and in the kitchen making me a sandwich. Like that's basically his worldview. Um, but one thing that's interesting about Peterson is that while he's very critical of the sort of like hedonism and sort of the breaking down of gender norms in society – He's actively supporting one of the very things that has caused it, which is neoliberal capitalism. Mm. So neoliberal capitalism atomizes everyone and it breaks down those barriers in order to to have us be sort of pliable consumers. And in doing that, it actually makes it like neoliberalism caters to people's different desires. So that's why you have like Pride Month sponsored by Bank of America or Black Lives <laughs> Matter supported by J.P. Morgan yep. Chase, right? So, like, that doesn't discount those social movements, right? But, like, capitalism exists to do that. So, but then, but so, like, Peterson's very critical of things that come out of capitalism, the sort of liberalization of social norms and gender norms and cultural norms, while at the same time talking so about how wonderful... Uphold capitalism. Yeah, talking about how wonderful <laughs> capitalism is, right? Mm -hmm. If Peterson was writing 500 years ago, he would be right. Basically, he would be using his writings to defend feudalism. I mean, that, that's, and so that's the thing about him. I mean, all these people are, in my opinion, most of these people, whether it's Peterson or Sam Harris, uh, especially Dave Rubin, they're all grifters and charlatans. I, I think some of them genuinely believe it. Like, I do think Peterson genuinely believes his bullshit. I think that Harrison Harris generally believes his bullshit. Dave Rubin believes in nothing. He's willing to sell himself out He's for a quick buck. To float left and right, whichever way the money flows. That's where but, Dave Rubin's going. But I'm rambling at this point. But basically, that was yeah. why I gave up on that whole thing was because I realized just how much of a fucking sham this whole thing is. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, that instead of using sort of the broad sept of skepticism to talk about like, hey – why are we still having discussions about evolution not being taught in science classes and like we should advocate for proper science education for vaccinations instead of doing shit like that they talk more about like we need to really ham you know hammer home the gender dif like the differences between the sexes and did you know that like and then like and then like Harris is like flirtation with race science with you know the charles mm -hmm. murray's of the world right so this idea of like black people have lower iqs and blah 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 and it's like and he's borrowing directly from the bell curve <laughs> yeah he's borrowing directly from the bell curve <laughs> which is borrowing directly from eugenicists a hundred years ago like it's it's the same arguments that people in the third reich used to justify the horatio the horrific crimes of the holocaust it's the same thing or the jim crow laws here in the united states mm -hmm. right because like the, the Third Reich learned how to do what it did to the Jews from the United States, what we did to African Americans. Like, it's, that's how they learn how to do it. And again, this goes back to Harris not knowing a fucking thing about history. And like, you know, and Peterson not knowing a fucking thing about science. It's like, this is, these, the thing is, is that, and this is the pitfall of the, the, the public intellectual, is that People sometimes think that because they're really, really, really smart in one specific area, that gives them the license to talk about everything. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't. It like, doesn't. You can, that, but you should be held up to scrutiny for it. That's not how generalism works. You, you know, people end up being specialists in one particular thing and generalists and everything else. If you're going to talk about a specific thing, go to the, the specialist and mm -hmm. then blend that conversation with a specialist of another, find somebody who can do uh, an interspecialist analysis, and <laughs> <laughs> exactly out, like you know? it's actually having a dialogue with the actual research that's going on, right? Mm -hmm. You know, Charles Murray's race science was debunked before the book was even written. Mm -hmm. There's a classic book by Stephen Jay Gould, the, the late biologist, called "The Mismeasure of Man," that debunks all of this shit. I mean, and and he wrote that book like 15 years before 
uh, Murray and Herrnstein wrote The Bell Curve. But then what, what Gould did was he revised the book two or three years after The Bell Curve came out and included an entire chapter about The Bell Curve and basically laid out like, I cannot believe we still have to talk about this shit. Mm -hmm. um, because every every 20 years, this 20 to 25 years, this shit pops up again and again and again. It will not die. It's because you've got these crank ideologists who end up being smart in a specific area and are able to use their intelligence to go ahead and justify their, their crank ideology and then put it out to the masses. And because people give them authority because they're smart, it, it somehow pervades the masses. That's totally. why we got the, the bell curve still hanging on to this day. I mean, we've got Texas politicians who are trying to to utilize bell curve uh, suggestions, you know, in the back chapter of the book. Here's the policy suggestions that we we want you to to implement, and we've got Texas politicians trying to implement those things thirty years later. Exactly right, because the the ideas in that book have social and political implications. Mm -hmm which is something that Harris doesn't want to reckon with. I remember two or three years ago when he had his uh, conversation with Ezra Klein. I'm not a big fan of Ezra Klein. I think he's a bit of a neoliberal douche, but he did okay in this episode with Harris, right? He kept bringing up that, like, there might be some, like, cultural and historical reasons for why average IQ scores among African Americans are lower than white people. Maybe that's, you know, 400 years of, like, 400 years of oppression and slavery and then Jim Crow and segregation. And to this day, we still have basically segregated schools. We still have poorly funded schools. We still have horrible inequality. Like all of those factors that are real material factors of real living, breathing, thinking, feeling human beings mm -hmm. matter. And Harris basically says to him that none of that's relevant. All I care about is the science. That is one of the most intellectually dishonest positions to have because it's you are not engaging with reality. You are just taking numbers on a spreadsheet and saying, look, the numbers say this, therefore this, instead mm -hmm. of actually engaging with the work. And what Murray is, is Murray is a far right libertarian. He wrote a whole book mm -hmm. called Losing Ground where he argues for the elimination of the welfare state. Basically, the whole argument of the bell curve is black people are never, ever going to get any better or smarter. So why do we keep pouring billions of federal dollars into their lives? Fuck them. <laughs> like, that's basically that's what it boils down to. Yeah. Harris will never, ever flatly say that out because Harris is never, ever clear about anything ever. That's He's why I'm going to shoot himself in the foot that way. No, you know? because he he. he because Harris is a pussy, he's never willing <laughs> to actually take a position on anything. Mm -hmm. He does something called, I call it the Harris two-step, where he'll say a position and then immediately negate it in order to make it make it look like he's not an asshole. I mean, like, mm -hmm. so it's, I, you know, I mean, I haven't really actively engaged with his work in the last couple of years, but I've read all of his books. I, I of the four horsemen, he's the one I know the most about. Um, and... I can tell you right now, like, he's a gifted, he's a gifted rhetorical stylist. I think he's a good writer, mm -hmm. but a good thinker he is not. Yeah, e even his debates that he did in the past, uh, I mean, th those were critical in my formation as a, as the atheist that I am today. Even yeah. Even though I've, I've left a lot of that in the past now, it, it still seems that he was formative uh, to my own thoughts and ideas at this point. It's just that he's he's left so much of that behind. In I, his I, think it's, I think it's a mix of a couple things. One, I think it's a mix of him leaving it behind. Because I think he followed them. I'm sorry, like, I do think a lot of these people are grifters. You gotta, <laughs> you gotta follow the money. Yeah. So, like, and I say that, like, I'm a Marxist. So, like, I look at it as, what are the material conditions that lead people to do what they do? What are the economic conditions that people that leads people to do what they do. If you really look at him before, right? Like he was making money with those books. But ever since, like he has not written a full length book in, in six years. Mm -hmm. And doesn't even, it doesn't even really want to, right? Because he doesn't really have to now. He has the podcast, he's got the meditation app that he does. Like he makes way more money doing all of that than he ever did. Than he ever did get in a book, yeah. And so why the hell would he write a book about it, right? Why would he want it? Why would he want to? And so 
I don't think we'll see another book out of Harris in, for maybe five, 10 years, if he ever writes another one. I mean, I doubt it because I think he knows that like, I can make just as much money, if not more doing what I'm doing, right? And that's the thing, whether it was him or especially Dave Rubin, right? The more right wing and conservative and reactionary the, the, the content became, the more successful it became and the more lucrative it became. Mm -hmm. And so they sort of shifted who they were to the market. Now, Harris, I think, is definitely more consistent than Rubin. Rubin's an idiot. I mean, Rubin's not actually a thinker. Like, like Sam Harris actually does think about things. He's wrong, but like he's he's not an idiot. You know, and he's not even good at having a conversation. Dave no, Rubin. like <laughs> no, he just sits there like a deer in the headlights and lets you know uh, Stefan Molyneux say, "Hey, what can we learn about cranial sizes and intelligence?" Mm -hmm. And just let and just, huh, just that's sits interesting. There. That's yeah. interesting. Hmm. That's really interesting. And he Thanks sticks even for the insight. <laughs> and the thing that's like the biggest problem with Rubin is that like he always talks all the time about how like identity politics is a problem. And like political correctness is a problem and cultural politics are a problem, but all he does is cultural politics. That's all he does, right? Everything he talks, he never really talks about like, like, like when he, he never talks about inequality, he never talks about economic issues, or if he does, he talks about them in sort of the free market, broad, like abstract bullshit. He never ever talks about it in specifics. I mean, go back to the infamous Joe Rogan interview where Joe Rogan asked him basic fucking questions and made Dave Rubin look like a complete idiot, which he is. Again, and, and that's not saying a whole lot coming from Joe Rogan. No, Joe who Rogan, him, who no himself team. is is not the sharpest crayon in the box. No, and so like <laughs> that's the thing is that like there's a whole cottage industry of people who justify the the status quo of our society. There's a great uh, book that I read that was a, a critique of spirituality from the left. So it was like, uh, it was a leftist critique of sort of modern capitalist spirituality. It sort of plays in some of the stuff about with Zizek and Buddhism. Mm -hmm. And he makes a point of saying there's an enormous difference between public intellectuals. So like Cornel West is a public intellectual, okay? Um, I'm trying to think of somebody on the right who would be his parallel. Um, but like... You know, somebody like, I don't know, like Arthur Brooks, who runs American Enterprise Institute, you can make an argument that he's a public intellectual, right? But then there are other people, and they're called thought leaders. Thought leaders are people who sort of churn out books, they do TED Talks, and at the end of the day, what their whole worldview is, is reinforcing the status quo of our society. So, like, that's, you know... Uh, uh, you know, I hate to dog him. I see, I see a, a book of him on your shelf back there, but that's Steven Pinker. Like Steven Pinker yeah. is, is, is a thought leader. He's not a public mm -hmm. intellectual. His engagement with philosophy is atrocious. That, that end of that book, Enlightenment Now, which there's a lot of good in that book. Like, don't get me I, wrong. I think, I, I think to be fair, I, I haven't cracked it yet. I made it to the introduction and I've put it down for something else, but <laughs> there's some stuff in the book that's good. Mm -hmm. The stuff, it's the stuff towards the end that's really bad. His his reading of Nietzsche is horrible. It's like a 12-year-old's version of reading Nietzsche. Like, he read the Cliff Notes website of Nietzsche it, and then moved on. It's like a Peterson it's, critique of Marxism. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, like, it's, it's not really actually engaging with the material and the complexities of the material, but sort of caricatures of the material. Um, but, again, it's it's... At the end of the day, what they're doing is they're churning out thoughtful material that essentially reinforces the, the existing class and, and, and structural relations. I'm more interested in writers and thinkers who challenge that system. So mm -hmm. Cornell West is somebody like that, right? Yeah, and, and I haven't read any of West's books, but I've, I've only recently discovered Cornell West as a public figure within the last couple months because I saw he did an interview on um oh shit what's the guy's name he's the he's the co-host on the majority report michael brooks i've been talking about him tonight. yeah yes. yeah michael brooks i yes. knew you had mentioned his name but i've already forgotten it but <laughs> i i saw i saw cornell west do like an hour and a half long interview on michael brooks's show and was was completely blown away by the things he had to say and i've been good going down a, a cornell west binge lately especially 
as he uh, as he tends to his analysis of Christianity and its relationship to culture is a breath of fresh air. Totally. When when we're comparing it to what mainstream modern Christianity is, it's and how did he? And the question is, how did he get there? He got there through Marxism. He got yep. there through Marxism by way of Antonio Gramsci, the, the great Italian Marxist thinker who talks about hegemony, right? So, like, that's how West gets to it. His two classic books that are, I think, essential reading for anyone, especially right now in the moment we're living in with the the continued police violence against people of color, um, is Race Matters, which is <laughs> incredible. And Democracy Matters. Both of those books are wonderful. Um, I did the audiobooks of both because he reads them. Oh. Uh, and so, okay. like, that's the way to... I love to hear him. He writes for it to be performed. He's just as eloquent and sort of, and sort of like, uh, uh, sp- like, spiritually sort of engaging in that text as he would be in on the page. So both I, of those I, books I are great. I have a few audible credits built up, so I'll have to go and, and yeah. get... Yeah. Yeah. He's great. And I guess he's doing his own podcast now, which I think is called like oh, I didn't know that. Or something. Yeah, I guess he just started it. But but yeah, no, Cornel West is incredible. Like there are people who are worth listening to who really are public intellectuals. Mm-hmm. You know, somebody like Harvey K, professor of history at University of Wisconsin, who writes about the New Deal and Franklin Roosevelt and Thomas Paine. Like he's somebody to to to, to get to the sort of broader progressive sort of uh, spirit of America that is the different side of America, you know, because there's the other side of sort of oppression and white supremacy and colonialism and imperialism. But there's also this other side of enlightenment and democracy and mm-hmm. pluralism. And he writes about that. So like there there are people worth engaging. And that's the thing, like of the, the people we've sort of been, you know, talking shit about um, <laughs> or critiquing, right? Uh-huh. For every Sam Harris, there's a Stephen Batchelor. For every Jordan Peterson, there's a Ken Wilber, right? Mm-hmm. You know, for every sort of right-wing fanatic Christian, there's a Cornell West. There's somebody who's better at doing what that person is doing and who's better at it. They're just fundamentally better at it. They're better thinkers. They're better writers. They're better people. So, yeah, I mean, that's the thing is it's like finding better sources to go to. And I think that's it. So my broader point I was going to say earlier is like not only have like we've changed as people, but so have they. And Mm -hmm. so it's like we abandon or to a certain extent, we abandon people like Sam Harris because at some point you sort of grow out of that, you Mm -hmm. know, because he kind of says the same four or five things over and over and over again. And you kind of go like, well, there's not much here. Right. Yeah. I mean, I left Matt Dillahunty behind. Yeah. It's the same shit. A while ago, you know, I mean, once I realized it was there was nothing new there yeah and once i realized that he was engaging with you know christianity and biblicism the same way biblicalists biblicalists were doing on mm-hmm. their end without taking account into any nuance whatsoever it, it was time to give it up totally and i think that i gave up in the atheist community of austin primarily when they got into the whole uh they got into the whole um, trans people in sports oh, controversy, yeah. and yeah. they completely that, that's shit. That's about. Them. That's about the same time I left. I mean, that's and they what... completely shit the bed on that and look mm-hmm. like complete morons. Um, now, that's not to say, not all of the atheist community of Boston is like that. I think it's important to note that there were people mm-hmm. within that organization, people like Jen Peoples and Tracy mm-hmm. Harris, and and I think Martin Wagner, like others, who were like, no, 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 we don't agree with this. But Dylan Honey sort of planted his feet in and sort of doubled down on it. So did Aaron Ross. So did all these people. And you just look like an asshole. And it's like, and it's like for people who love to talk all the time about how much they love science, the science on gender is incredibly complex and multidimensional. And to paint and like to paint, and that whole came from a guy named Rationality Rules, a YouTuber mm-hmm. who made a video about trans athletes. That was incredibly transphobic and ignorant and and sort of had to, you know, you know, and kind of go ate shit for it. Update himself. And yeah. And he had to go know. back and update himself and blah, blah, blah. It's like at the end of the day, like, what are you fighting for? Like, mm-hmm. what is the point of all of this? I, I don't really understand. But yeah, I mean, you... at, at a certain point, it was it was fighting for for essentially ideological supremacy without yes. taking into account the the nuance of the arguments that were being made 
Like, while I don't agree with any of the shit Stephen said, like, at least he was... He, he had the wherewithal enough to go back and, and take the criticisms, you know, on the chin and update yeah. himself as, as appropriate. Whereas the atheist experience or the atheist community of Austin, they, they drug their feet through all that and just handled it atrociously. Yeah. And I think, and I think it was terrible. And I think that that was kind of the moment I was like, I'm done with this shit. Mm -hmm. I'm just done with this shit. Um, you know, I, I am an atheist, but I no longer have that as the central fact of my identity that I view everything through. I just don't give a shit about that anymore. Like I, I'm much more, I'm way more interested in just learning about the world and trying to come at it from a unique perspective of my own that's mm -hmm. influenced by a multitude of different sources and viewpoints. I'm just not interested yep. in, you know, hiding behind a sort of facade anymore. That's why, like when I really did start to come back more and be public about stuff, I'm just me. Like the last yeah. project I did was reason revolution. I don't hide behind titles anymore. You know, you want my work, you go to justinclark.org. When I come on to shows, I'm just me. Like I don't, you know, I don't, I don't have to act like as a mon, like I belong to this like monolith anymore, which I'm very happy about. I don't even honestly like the label atheist anymore like there was a point where i wore it proudly you know it's it's my badge of honor i'm an atheist i came out of fundamentalism here's here i am and was just loud and proud and angry and mm -hmm. uh you know after all this time to to contemplate and engage with buddhist thought and engage with uh with honestly like marxist thought has yes. been absolutely enlightening and I, I want to I wanna talk more about Marxism in a little bit. But, awesome. Um, like, I don't even like the label atheist anymore. Like, it, it's, it's a meaningless label to begin with because it, it, it doesn't mean anything. It's a negation of a point. You're defining it, yourself in opposition to someone else mm -hmm. instead of actually saying what you are. That's part of the reason why I tend to prefer the term humanist, which is what I am, mm -hmm. you know. I am an atheist. I am a materialist, but those are sort those are sort of components to the broader view, which is that I'm a secular mm -hmm. humanist, mm -hmm. um, who is influenced by not just the grand and and very noble and honorable secular traditions, but also the religious traditions that are worthwhile. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's how I view it now. Yeah, I mean there there are even elements of modern day Christianity who are just awash in humanism, and I, totally goodness, I I love those those lines of thought. Like while while I don't agree with the 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 ascribing any of that to a deity mm -hmm. uh, the the conversation still is meaningful regardless because it describes our interrelations and describes our relation to to the world etc so it, it's it's so much better oh totally i think of people like i haven't engaged with his work a lot but i know of him somebody like john shelby spong who is sort of like yeah. that yeah you know mm -hmm. there's another woman i can't remember her name but there's another Ah, oh, there's like, I mean, obviously you have people like Karen Armstrong too, but like that's that's what I was thinking, Karen Armstrong. But there's another one. There's another woman specifically who comes out of the Christian tradition who writes sort of about broadly religious people, or if you even think of somebody from a you know from a half century ago, somebody like Reinhold Niebuhr, who was very influential on Martin Luther King, you know, who sort of had um, a rich theological tradition too. I think theology is worthwhile. I think religious studies yeah. are worthwhile. Um, because again, they're much more than just like, do you believe in God, like, or whatever. It's like, those are the most, those are the least interesting questions. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, because at the end of the day, like, there are some religious people who I would side with, you know, you know, six days a week and twice on Sunday mm -hmm. over a, a, a who over like a reactionary atheist. Like, yep. I would like I will I will be way more on the side of people like Cornel West or um, or uh, uh, Elon Omar, the great uh, Muslim congresswoman from Minnesota, than I'll ever be with somebody like an asshole like Lawrence Krauss or Sam Harris or uh, that shitbag David Silverman, who who is a total jerk and yet somehow failed upwards to get a job at Atheist Alliance of America, my, my former stomping ground. So, uh -huh. you know... There's no consequences for being an for being an absolute creep, and mm -hmm. being a complete moral reprobate in the atheist community. It, mm -hmm. Like, like Silverman, 
was accused of sexual misconduct, siphoning money away from atheists, uh, mm -hmm. uh, American atheists, all kinds of horrible shit. And now he's got a job with, with Atheist Alliance of America. Lawrence Krauss was accused of very many credible allegations of sexual assault, one including rape, and now has his own podcast as is still doing events with Richard Dawkins. Like, these people never pay the price for being completely morally transgressive, and that's a problem to me. Because I'm sorry, I keep hitting on that point, but it's just, it really bothers me. They're, they're ideological figureheads at this point, and it doesn't, yes. matter, it doesn't matter what they do, because they're, they're still... They themselves are, from from the fans' perspective, yep. they themselves are stripped of their personhood and are given uh, idol status. Yep. And, and they put asses in the seats. I mean, mm -hmm. that's at the end of the day, they put asses in the seats. People want I mean, to see that kind of shit. It's essentially this, the same exact thing as a religious mindset. Like, yep. it doesn't matter what asshole shit God does in the Old Testament. Like, he's still God. Yeah, And yep. it's the same... <laughs> or it's like, or it's like Lawrence Krauss is our, like David Silverman is our Jim Baker, right? So like, yeah. you know, Jim Baker, the televangelist from the eighties who had multiple affairs, embezzled money, did all kinds of like really evil, horrible shit, but now like has completely rehabilitated his career and now sells like food buckets and shit. Sells but like, it's over 10 cures that are supposed to sell or are supposed ridiculous. to heal COVID, like people, you know? <laughs> yeah. Just absolutely insane. But yeah, I mean, I think. You know, the real shift for me in terms of how I viewed all of this was getting into Marxism. I mean, to me, Marx was and Marx's atheism is interesting because he is an atheist. He does reject religion, but he does it in a very interesting way. So he does it in a way that is related to material conditions. So you get into the classic quote of Marx, like religion is the opinion of people. Most people sort of tend to take that out of context, like what he actually says is something along the lines of like religion is the hope in the hopeless world it's the sigh of the oppressed peoples it's the opiate you know it's the sigh of the oppressed nations it's the opiate of the people and he writes about that in something called a critique of hegel's philosophy of right and marx's point is basically saying that like the reason that people are religious is because their material conditions are so horrible that they have religion as a means of being able to continue living without having any sense of hopelessness mm -hmm. and that if we lived in a society where more people's material needs were met you would have people who are less religious and you can see that that's an empirical fact if you go around the world the more wealthy and prosperous and healthy a society is the less religious it is mm -hmm. you know and that sort of proves marx's point um but then there are ways of engaging with religion that are of a Marxist bent, right? And so it's about really looking at, at the end of the day, like kind of what I've been reiterating here is that like Marx is all about what are the material conditions that set forth the kind of phenomenon that we are seeing, particularly in the social realm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm so I'm a bit of a, a baby when it comes to Marxism. Like I, I've only just started to get my, my toes wet over yeah. the last few months. Unless you're David Harvey, I think we all are. So it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, as a historian, I'm sure you have uh, some insights or perspective on this, right? But nowadays with, like, the polemic against uh, any sort of leftist analysis of anything is uh, socialism and communism are scare words. Uh, Marxism, like, oh, you're a Marxist. It's, it's a polemic against just the individual uh, itself. But when, if you look back in history, you've got the New Deal era, which was really a socialist uh, yeah. introduction to the economy, to the American economy. Uh, but all of a sudden we've got, what, the Cold War and the Red Scare and McCarthyism. And all of those things sort of culminated into the fear-mongering that we yeah. have today. Like, break that down for, <laughs> for sure. me. Sure. So, in the United States, so the history of socialism in America in many ways actually goes back to the founding. So one of the founding fathers, I would argue probably the greatest founding father, who is Thomas Paine. Mm -hmm. um, Thomas Paine, who wrote Common Sense, Rights of Man, wrote a critique of religion called The Age of Reason, which is incredible. Mm -hmm. um, Paine wrote a book called uh, uh, Agrarian Justice, okay, where he talks about the idea of basically instituting what we would call today a universal basic income. Um, so he argued for, you know, that or what we what eventually would come become Social Security. 
So it goes all the way back to the founding. And there have always been sort of socialistic elements within the American experiment. They're never at the forefront, but they're there. And so you skip a century or so later and you get to um, the populist movement. So you have coming out of the late 19th century, you have something called the Knights of Labor. Lates of Knights of Labor are not exclusively a socialist um, tradition, but they're a populist tradition. And out of that populist tradition of people like the Knights of Labor, and particularly William Jennings Bryan, who was a Democratic candidate in 1896, he gave something called the Cross of Gold speech, where he sort of talks about going against the gold standard, which, which McKinley, who was his opponent who would win the election, um, was running for in support of. And then, of course, all of this culminates in the probably the most iconic socialist leader in America next to Bernie Sanders, and that is Eugene Victor Debs. Um, Eugene, Debs. so okay. Eugene Victor Debs is incredible. So Eugene Victor Debs is from my home state. Um, he's from Terre Haute, Indiana. Uh, he founds. Uh, uh, he's, he does a brief stint in Indiana legislature, and then becomes a trade unionist. Works for the Brotherhood of Locomotive Firemen. And eventually, he founds two unions in his lifetime. One's called the American Railway Union, which led to something called the Pullman Strike, which was this massive train strike that happened in uh, uh, Pullman, Illinois, right outside of Chicago. And then you also had something called the Industrial Workers of the World, or the IWW. And they're called the Wobblies. The IWW still exists today. Debs was instrumental in, in, in founding both of those organizations. Um, he ran for president multiple times. Uh, he got um, uh, uh, over a million votes in 1912, um, which was a very iconic election. That was the election where Teddy Roosevelt ran on the Bull Moose platform and split the Republican Party. Debs wins a million votes uh, as a socialist, and then Woodrow Wilson wins the presidency. And then he's imprisoned for speaking out against World War One. He's arrested in 1918 for giving an anti-war speech in Canton, Ohio. Um, and then goes to prison for speaking out against World War I under the Sedition Acts. Uh, and he runs for president one more time in 1920 as a prisoner. Um, his oh, campaign no. slogan was, you know, Eugene Victor Debs, you know, inmate number, and I always forget what the number is. <laughs> and there are posters of him and his, like, prison <laughs> guard, <laughs> Eugene Debs running for, and he wins nearly a million votes in the 1920 election. Holy shit. Um, and he eventually gets, uh, he gets his sentence commuted by President uh, uh, Warren Harding, and he dies in 1926. From there, you get somebody like Norman Thomas. Norman Thomas is another very prominent, important socialist leader in American history. He was sort of the, the heir apparent to Debs in the 19, you know, 20s, 30s, and 40s, runs for president multiple times. Um, and a lot of the New Deal programs that Roosevelt would institute came directly out of the Norman Thomas play platforms. Um, okay. You know, so Norman Thomas infamously said, he said, um, you know, uh, that um, he said that Roosevelt is burying my platform in a box. Um, and so, but yes, like, so the New Deal isn't really socialist. I think the better way to describe it is that it's social democratic. Yes. So it leaves, it leaves most of the levers of capitalism in place, right? You still have private ownership of the means of production. You still have shareholder capitalism. You still have, you know, uh, a hierarchy of, of bosses and workers. But what the New Deal does and what is important about the New Deal is that the New Deal for the first time really in American history, it shifts the balance of power back to workers in multiple ways. So you have something called the National Labor Relations Act, which is passed in 19, uh, I think, 35. Um, and it's called the Wagner Act. It's named after Senator yeah. Robert Wagner. Yeah. Uh, and it allows for collective bargaining of unions. Basically, it makes unions and unionizing legal in the United States. Now, this country has been fighting tooth and nail to remove any protections of the Wagner Act since it's been passed. You have Social Security. You have uh, you had um, stricter regulations on the banks. You had uh, deposit insurance for, for, for people so that you wouldn't have bank runs. There's a lot of good that comes out of the New Deal. The Tennessee Valley Authority, which electrified the, the, the rural South, which wouldn't have been electrified otherwise because there was no money in it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so 
throughout American history, socialism has always been there. The two sort of waves of opposition to it are both red scares. The first red scare happens around World War I, where we were talking about earlier, where they imprisoned Debs, they went after socialist leaders, they went after communist leaders. Again, it's it's a, it's in a response to not just World War I, but it's in response to the Bolshevik Revolution in yep. Russia mm -hmm. and, and the Bolsheviks winning, right? So that's that first wave. A lot of people get imprisoned, a lot of people get killed in that wave. The second wave is the one you were talking about, the McCarthy era. You know, it's yep. a post Cold War, uh, you know, and of course you have like you know, you have Alger Hiss, who was who was a State Department official who was accused of being a communist spy, and then you have, you know, the McCarthy hearings and this and that and the other. You have uh, screenwriters being blacklisted. Yeah, did they did a whole thing in Hollywood where they were rooting communists and socialists out and didn't Harry Truman do something with like a loyalty order where he was going around to, to different Yes. Uh, federal workers and say and essentially requesting that they demonstrate uh, allegiance to the state yes and that was in response to his that was in spot response to alger his yeah and okay. so you're right and so what happens in hollywood is something called which Blast itself is like a bit ironic yes it like, is right? to, to the, to the, yeah, the, the very the very things that were used by stalin when stalin took over the soviet union were also tactics used to control dissent within america like mm -hmm. that's where it's important to like historicize things because it, it, things get kind of messy like the soviet union is a very mixed bag um like but there's a lot of good that comes out of the soviet union i mean the soviet union basically goes from being a rural european backwater to the second industrial power of the world in basically 30 years Oh, I didn't realize it was that fast. So it's like, wow. like the amount of technological and economic progress that they have within 30 to 40 years by the time you get to World War II is insane. And then by the time you get to the 50s and 60s, they're the second superpower, We're economic power. Them for the moon. The moon, yeah. right? So, yes, the, that, you know, that does not negate any of the repression of that system. Mm -hmm. But our system has in itself also has its own oppression. You know, people talk about, oh, well, communism killed 100 million people. Well, you know that like, you know, the capitalist system of the United States was built on the genocide of Native Americans and the enslavement of African Americans. You know, 100 million, probably 100 million Native Americans died during the purges mm -hmm. of, you know, and, and millions of slaves died. So it's like no hands are clean in any system of this. But you can't have an honest conversation about this at all because people are so wedded to their sense of like patriotism and their sense of like moral righteousness that they can't seem to understand the fact that shit's complicated. Right. And, and, and you know, when they start conflating religion and patriotism, you know, when we add uh, under God to the, uh, to the pledge of allegiance, I mean, it all just starts getting intertwined and muddled up and it's harder and harder to divorce those, those histories and those ideological, um, uh, specific specificities. Yep. Be and because they're all being muddled together. Totally. And and with, when it comes to like, in God we trust being on our money, or mm -hmm. one nation under God being the play, all of that stuff happens in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. It all happens as a direct result of the Cold War. Um, you know, it's about to go. It's about going after the godless communists, right? So, you know, it's. Which, of course, negates the fact that there's a rich history in the United States of free thought, right? Like, that there were atheists and agnostics and free thinkers of all stripes who didn't particularly belong to any particular origin or, or irreligious, who made many good contributions to this country. Uh, you know, but so, like, there's that. It just negates an entire people. But... I mean, there, there's also, like, the influence of the Scopus Monkey trial that, yep. that just reinvigorated Christian fundamentalism, like... And brought it right back into the forefront of American thought, you know. Totally. It, th there's so much intermingling of all this stuff. Totally. Sorry, you, you were nope. in the middle of something. No, you're <laughs> fine. No, no, I'm sorry. I, I, I know I tend to go on because I'm trying to. I tend to talk, and I have sort of a broad point. You know, stop me, please interrupt me if I'm going too on, going on too long. But yeah, no, I think you're right. I mean, the Scopes trial is an incredibly important event. It happens in 1925 in uh, Tennessee. John Scopes was a uh, was a high school biology teacher, um, and he was basically recruited by the ACLU to do um, a free speech case, which is what it was. And it became this national phenomenon where, 
you know, William Jennings Bryan, who I talked about earlier, the, the, the populist candidate for president, be, comes down to support, you know, the, the law of banning the teaching of evolution because he was a creationist. And then on the scope side, you have the, the legendary, one of my heroes, Clarence Darrow. Um, who who had worked with Debs, supported uh, who, uh, who who represented Debs during the Pullman strike, um, supported unions. He was a union lawyer. He gave up a big corporate railroad firm job in 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 law to become a uh, a attorney for the damned, as they called him. <laughs> and uh, and so, you know, there's this great you know, trial. It goes on for days. The 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 iconic journalist H. L. Mencken comes to town and he writes about it, and he calls the people of the town the bourgeoisie, which is always a good name. And so you know, it's a very iconic moment, right? And so people always forget that like Scopus was convicted, right? And he had to pay like a thirty dollar fine. It ends up going to the Supreme Court, and they throw it out on a technicality. So like people tend to forget the actual end of the case, but. Um, and, it, and, and of course, it inspired a very famous stage play called Inherit the Wind, which is a great movie. Um, but it is really about free speech. It's about, you know, and free speech has become sort of, it's been sort of like polluted by uh, right-wing reactionaries. But free speech is a noble tradition that should be upheld and should be defended. And that was what Darrow was doing in the Scopes trial. But it really did, I think, underscore, as you said, the, the real divides between sort of secularism and multiculturalism and modernity, basically, with fundamentalism and, and backwardness. Mm-hmm. But, so, yeah. I, I yeah. injected that somewhere in the middle of you were, you were discussing uh, 1940s socialist movements. And I was just injecting Scope's trial as a as a subtext, <laughs> and then yeah. I cut you off. <laughs> no, you're fine. So, so, so let's totally let's fine. bring let's bring that back to uh, to McCarthyism and uh, and how that how that continues to erode our trust in in Marxist thought. Sure. So you have Senator Joseph McCarthy from Wisconsin. Um, he basically accused uh, multiple people in the U.S. government of being communists. He said he had a list. Which again, he never shared with anybody. It was essentially a moral panic. He 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 led multiple hearings, um, which, and and this is where Lyndon Johnson becomes a bit of a hero because he was the Senate Majority Leader at the time, and and uh, basically Lyndon Johnson's idea was let's put the bastard on TV, he'll hang himself, which which is pretty true. I mean, that's pretty much what happened in the in the hearings. You get the sort of like, have you no decency, sir? This you know the classic things. Mm-hmm. But you had in the time you had something that was called the House Un-American Activities Committee or HUAC, and HUAC was uh, this you know. So you had that, and then you had in the McCarthy hearings, which were in the Senate. HUAC was also important too because you had a lot of people coming in to speak, um, either uh, people who sort of would take the fifth and they wouldn't talk. So you had people like. Um, Dalton Trumbo, who was a screenwriter, who was who was a communist, who was who was a socialist, um, who um, continued to work in Hollywood after the blacklist of the 1950s and 40s and 50s, but he did it under different names. Like he wrote um, Spartacus, but it's not written as Dalton Trumbo. He wrote oh, it with some pen name. So yeah, so like Dalton Trumbo is one of them. Uh, you have actors who end up getting blacklisted. Uh, two notable people who testified during the the peerings of the time. One was Ronald Reagan, mm-hmm. uh, who at the time was a New Deal Democrat and was a was a sort of rising voice in what was called the Screen Actors Guild. People forget that the first executive job that Ronald Reagan, Mr. Anti Government, had was as the head of a union. Um, most people tend to forget that, which is it, so interesting, seeing yeah. as what he did in his presidency. Yeah, just... right. <laughs> Going after the air traffic controllers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. the other person, uh, based on my sort of knowledge of, 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 of her work and her history, is Ayn Rand, who testifies, the novelist, oh, the right wing yeah. novelist yeah. who talk, testifies in the UAC um, hearings. But Kennedy, not Kennedy, uh, uh, McCarthy basically gets exposed for being a liar and charlatan. And so the McCarthy era kind of ends. But the Cold War antagonism towards the left never really does. And this is where, basically to this day, the left was in retreat, especially post-1968. You know, the, the left in this country basically retreated to academia, um, which is where it largely is today. 
and which is why we have so many uh, right wing and Christian folks who are so skeptical of the colleges and so skeptical of academia in general. Like goodness, yeah. the, the religion I came, I grew up in, and the religion I came out of was essentially anti anti science in general, especially anti academia. Like goodness, don't go to college. Go to Bible school, because by <laughs> college they'll infect you with, uh, with their left wing propaganda, and that's like the scare that mm-hmm. is coming down to the preachers through all the apologetics. And ironically enough, most most people within mainstream academia who are on the broader left are not socialists. They're not Marxists. No, they're they're, not. they're, of, the, they're of the liberal left. These are people who broadly identify themselves as Democrats, not Marxists. Mm-hmm. So. There are Marxists. I mean, there are people like, you know, obviously people like Adolf Reed um, Jr. or um, obviously Angela Davis. Like there are people, who Richard Wolff, like there are people who come out of that Marxist tradition very explicitly and who held professorships. And that was definitely more the case in the 1970s. But the left basically retreated and they gave up class politics and in favor of sort of identity politics. Mm. Well, the left has tried identity politics, and it's really not working. So what you're really seeing now is a resurgence of class politics, which I think is very healthy, right? So you have the, and it, it was a long journey, right? So like the real reemergence of class politics really starts in the late 1990s with the protests against the World Trade Organization that happened in Seattle. Mm. So the World Trade Organization was set up around that time, 1998, 99, somewhere around that. And these massive, massive protests against the WTO um, because the WTO was this giant agreement that would give a blank check to corporations to basically do whatever they wanted to do around the world um, in what they in what economists call a race to the bottom. So it's, you know, sweat, sweatshops, slave wages, you know, uh, you know, it horrible working conditions. Um, This is the infamous story of like iPhones. People were many iPhones are manufactured. They have suicide nets. Um. So the WTO is really important. Then yeah, you have it was essentially the 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 beginning stages of neoliberalism. Yes, absolutely. Like neoliberalism yeah. is completely codified during the WTO era. Mm-hmm. Then you have the opposition to the Iraq War, which is incredibly important. That's where I came to political consciousness was as a teenager being against the war. And I lived in a rural Indiana town, mm-hmm. the liberal being against the war. And then and then you had uh and then you had sort of the hope of what the Obama movement represented, but the Obama movement sort of fizzled out. But yeah, then the real kind of disappointment overall. Totally. Absolute which... disappointment. And, you know, he basically he basically tried to run with the social movement and then left the social movement behind as soon as he became president. And that was to his detriment. That's why he really wasn't able to accomplish that much after two mm-hmm. years. Um and then you have Occupy Wall Street. Occupy Wall Street's a very incredibly transformative watershed moment of the resurgence of class politics. And all of this culminates in, in the, the two campaigns of Bernie Sanders yep. and the rise of the, the, the broader left movement that's sort of really coming into the fore now. I mean, you obviously you have Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, you have Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, mm-hmm. you have Julia Salazar in New York, who's elected from the Democratic Socialists of America. The Democratic Socialists of America has membership numbers that a socialist organization hasn't had since the 1940s. I'm a member of the DSA. Um, And uh, so there is a real resurgence of left politics. And I think what the left politics we have today is a really good blending of all of the insights of class-based analysis with the necessary and integral analyses of identity and understanding the, the, you know, and it's a word that gets thrown out a lot, but it's true, the intersectionality, intersectionality of it, right. right? The relationship between race, class, and gender, and how those yep. play out. And, and how, you know, we need to, not only do we need to center race, not only do we need to center gender, not only do we need to center, um, you know, sexual orientation, but we do need to center class. Because class is the unifying force that can bring a lot more people together than just identities alone. So that's kind of so I think which wow. is really interesting when when you get to the point where we are today where the the people of uh, of the largest classes are identifying with the people of the smallest classes and and doing so under the banner of the leftist boogeyman of Marxism 
Like, and they don't even understand what Marxism is. No, they don't. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that Marx is a European. It's a European philosophy. Mm -hmm. You know, the United States was founded on enlightenment principles that come primarily out of England. It's the English tradition, the English and and the Scottish enlightenment, too. Marx was someone who never really caught on in a way that, say, you know, the Enlightenment thinkers did. But having isn't, said, isn't it because Marx was more of an Eastern European than a Western European? Well, he was from Germany, so he was Western European. But okay. I really think what separates him is that he's not an Anglo philosopher. Yeah, he's a continental philosopher, and continental yeah. philosophy has always been very different. Um, people sort of see socialism as being this sort of ooh weird foreign boogeyman kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Whereas, but they don't realize like there's a very rich Marxist tradition in the United States. It's small, it's not in the foreground, but it's there. And, you know, it is with people like Angela Davis. It's with and people before her. It's somebody like A. Philip Randolph, who was one of the main organizers of the March on Washington in 1963 who was an African-American, who a uh, labor organizer, he worked for the AFL-CIO. There was a large socialist and communist contingent within the CIO uh, in the 1930s and 40s mm. um, that were eventually purged out because the unions became more conservative as they got larger. The three big unions, the UAW, the United Auto Workers, the AFL-CIO, and the Teamsters unions all became very staunchly anti-communist. So that leads to the the second Red Scare, too. Like, not only is it McCarthyism, but it's the purging of socialists and communists from the labor movement. Which itself is interesting, because also in America is this rich history of uh, worker co-ops. Yes. uh, You know, for a a previous job, I used to travel to Wisconsin a lot. I'm in Michigan now. But I used to travel to Wisconsin a lot, and there was this grocery store there, and I want to say it was Wegmans or something like that. Yeah, Wegmans, yep. But Wegmans was a, it's a pretty uh, well-known co-op organization there in in that Wisconsin region. And people just don't know what co-ops are outside of, outside of Wisconsin. Like nobody here in Michigan knows what a worker co-op is. The the only ones we have are small, uh, small little, uh, you know, grocery stores downtown that are more specialized in, you know, self-grown fruits and vegetables than they are. In, in a broad, large grocery store. And when people are just so caught up in, in the structure of their modern day workplace, like we've got a CEO and we've got all our leadership team and we've got all our workers and how stacked and structured it is, there's no democracy in the workplace whatsoever. No. Like, which is crazy because we live in this democratic society and we try to uphold the democratic ideals and even our workplaces are at best, feudal, miniature fiefdoms, you know? Uh, When when in reality, we could all be working in democratic uh, environments where we're building each other up and we're profit sharing, etc. And that's just not a reality that exists in anyone's mind. No, it isn't. And, you know, worker co-ops are something that have a very rich heritage in the United States. Uh, Before the crash from an estimation from Richard Wolff, who writes very eloquently about worker co-ops, um, his whole organization, Democracy at Work, is devoted to it, um, is that there were about six to 7,000 worker co-ops in the United States, um, which is small, but pretty great. And and some of them are, ver- some of them are famous. Like uh, among left circles, a lot of people know about Red Emma's, which is this bookstore and cafe that's in Baltimore. It's named oh. after the radical anarchist Emma Goldman. And uh, it's a worker co-op. And then, of course, the example that, that Wolf uses all the time, it's not in the United States, is the Madrigon Corporation in Spain, which is this enormous, yeah. massive corporation, which is a worker co-op. Now Don't they have like a million employees there? Yes, yes. There's something and, more than that even, yeah. And there are, there. I mean, now the thing is, like, is there pay disparity? Yes. But the yeah. difference is, is that like, it's like eight to one, whereas the United States from CEO to average worker, it's like 350 to one, right? Mm-hmm. So one of the, the real canards of Marxism that people trot out, and this is something that Mr. Jordan Peterson does too, is that Marx That's wanted... Fresh, by the way. Thanks. Yeah. You just do Kermit the Frog. It's basically Kermit the Frog, you got uh-huh. it. Clean, uh, your, clean, your, clean your room. Um, you know, 
uh, Zizek's response to the whole set your house in order before you criticize the world thing mm -hmm. was brilliant, which is that sometimes you can't criticize the, sometimes you can't set your house in order because society is broken. So yep. in, some, in order to set your house in order, you actually have to criticize the world and fight for a better world in order to set your house in order. Like they, the two go hand in hand. It's not either or it's dialectical, yeah. right? There, there's no chicken before the egg here. It's... Yeah, there's exactly. Yeah. But, uh, with, but with worker co-ops and with the modular corporation, like, Oh, this is where I was going. So Marx and the whole thing is a quality of outcome. Marx never advocated for the equality of outcome ever, mm -hmm. ever. And one of the most explicit versions of that is there's an essay, uh, 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 an essay he wrote called The Critique of the Gotha Program. Um, it's basically his marginalia on um, the German Workers' Party in Germany at the time, what would become S SPD, which exists today. It was two socialist parties coming together to form a larger socialist party, social democratic party in Germany. They had written a program, it's called the Gotha Program. It basically critiques it. It makes the argument that like, when you listen to a phrase like from each, because this is where you get the classic phrase of Marx, from each according to his ability to each according to his need, right? There's nothing in that statement that says that everybody is equal. Nothing. What it is saying is that no one should, should live without a basic level of subsistence, right? Mm -hmm. From each according to his ability means that you put in what you can. Some people are stronger than others. Some people are smarter than others. That's just a fact of life, you know? We're not asking in the worker co-ops, the ones who are able to manage get voted into the man into the management. Exactly. Spot. Right. Some people are sort of natural leaders and that's what they want to do. And some people are naturally happy doing more of the regular day to day work. Right. Mm -hmm. That's OK. To each according to his need is exactly the same thing. It's it's needs can be very different depending on who you are. So Marx lays out like a need for a single person is very different than a need of a family. And mm -hmm. those needs are going to be different. So are we going to pay the single person the same as we pay the family? No because the needs for the family are different, right? So like, if if Peterson had just taken the literally the hour it takes to read the Gotha program, he would know that his whole critique of Marxism is bullshit. Like it's like, and I'm not even asking him to read the manifesto. I'm not even asking him to read Capital. I mean, I'm just that's him to that's read only where his yes, critique man. comes from is, is a, 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 a over reading of the manifesto and that's it. It totally is, right? But it's, like Marx lays out explicitly, like socialism will not solve all of our problems, but it will solve a hell of a lot more of them than the system we have now. Mm -hmm. And like what socialism basically is, is it's extending democracy to every aspect of our lives. Mm -hmm. That's how Richard Wolff sort of talks about it. The great Marxist economist. He says, like you said earlier, right? Corporations are basically these mini fiefdoms that exist independently of democracy. There is no democracy in shareholder capitalism. There just isn't. Right. And we've seen how disastrous that is for the economy, how disastrous that is for workers and how disastrous that is for the environment. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, how disastrous it is for capitalism, because capitalism continually is catastrophic because we run it the way that we do. I mean, so it's, it's so focused on itself that it ends up shooting itself in the foot, trying to better itself. Like, totally. it, and, and what it needs to do is just extend a hand. You know? Exactly. I mean, it's there are certain things to me that should be decommodified. They should not be a commodity. Healthcare should not be a commodity. Mm -hmm. um, internet access should not be a, a commodity. These should be public utilities. These should be public goods. Socialism is about the viability of public goods for all. And that doesn't mean a handout. Like we would, you know, it, if somebody would say like, oh, if for Medicare for all, you'll have to pay more in taxes. Yeah, I will. But my costs are going to go dramatically down because I don't have to pay for co-pays. I don't mm -hmm. have to pay for deductibles and I don't have to pay for premiums. The health insurance industry goes away. I'm going to spend about half of what I did under the private insurance industry through taxes. I would gladly pay more taxes to not have to deal with the private insurance industry. Mm -hmm. When people say like, oh, people want people want choice. People want their health insurance. No one wants their health insurance. Yeah. Well, no well, one well, likes we... their health insurance. They like having it. Because mm -hmm. it's the op the other option is is to have nothing, but people don't like it, and like this idea that like people like it. The only people who like their health insurance are wealthy people because they can pay for it. But what we end up encountering in in response to to that, like I would also gladly pay more taxes to not have to deal with that. But I live in a bubble where most of my uh, the people I interact with are 
right leaning or Christian leaning, that sort of thing. Like I'm, I'm a bit of an island uh, here in my little world. And what I encounter uh, a lot of times is when you bring up conversations around healthcare for all and uh, the, the response that we get a lot, especially from those who lean more libertarian, mm -hmm. is that uh, it's essentially the response is, fuck you, I've got mine. Yeah. And it's it, it screams to me of, of a selfishness that could, could really only exist in an individualist Mm -hmm. uh, capitalist society, and they don't even realize it, right? But like, why would I pay for anyone else's health insurance? Like, what if if they're not pulling their own weight? Like that yeah. that's what that's what the idea becomes is if if you're not being productive, if you're not engaging in society, why would we take care of you? Why would I pay for anyone else's health insurance? Why would I pay for anyone else's income w without taking into account the the human nature and and the the breadth of uh, of diversity within what it means to be human. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. It's crazy. Like, I think that when you kind of, when it's coming to discussions like this, I mean, one of the things that biggest failures, like we're living through this COVID crisis and you see this revolt against masks and people wearing masks. Masks are shown to be very effective. Wear your masks. If you right. go out, um, the way that they framed selling people to wear masks was, you're helping others by wearing masks. Mm -hmm. Rule number one with dealing of America, that's never how you frame anything. Yeah. You got to frame it as this is going to help you. And like, that's kind of the thing. Like when it comes to Medicare for all, like sometimes that's the way to frame the discussion. It's like you say you are going to be able to be covered for everything. You will have either little to no or no out of pocket expenses and you will not have to worry about losing your job or your children because you lose your job. Mm -hmm. You will have a lot more benefits under this system and a lot more protections than you would under the system you have now. You have to, sometimes with some people, you have to talk about it in very selfish terms. But there's but here's the thing. It's that whole individualism versus collectivism thing. The whole discussion is a bit of a red herring because as the great economist Karl Polanyi wrote about in The Great Transformation, he makes a point of saying that when you democratize society in a way, and mind you, Polanyi was not a Marxist. He was a Keynesian. He was a liberal. But he was more of a left liberal. And his whole point was, when you guarantee a certain level of material goods for everyone in society, you actually allow people to be more individuals than they would have been otherwise. Uh -huh. You actually allow people a lot more freedom and individuality than they would have otherwise. And I think it's an important, and there's a great YouTuber I like named Peter Coffin, who did a great mm. video about- I, I follow Peter Coffin. Peter's, yeah. Peter's mm -hmm. wonderful. And he did a great video maybe a year or two ago called Individualism versus Individuality. When most people are talking about individualism, what they actually mean is individuality, which is like, I wanna be my own person, I wanna live my own life, blah, 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 blah. That's mm. not what individualism is. Individualism is the political and economic doctrine of fuck you, I've got mine. That's yeah. what that is. Mm -hmm. It's the Ayn Rand. I, you know, it's literally the Ayn Rand thing. It's that I swear by my life and my love of it that I will not live for the sake of another man nor, nor ask that man to live for the sake of mine. It's literally her fucking mantra, right? And it's individualism is the idea of atomizing everyone to the, to the level of the individual and atomizing them and separating them out so that you cannot have any true social cohesion and social collectivity. And that's really harmful because humans don't respond well to this. We no. are a social collective species, <laughs> you know, despite what the objectivists say, despite what Ayn Rand fanboys say, we are a collective enterprise. We are the human species and we are, we interact with each other socially, whether you like it or not. And like when you create a society which has certain basic social goods for everyone, that are paid for by everyone and are given to by everyone, mm -hmm. then you actually allow people to be a hell of a lot more free and individual than they would be otherwise. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's it's the 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 common phrase like a rising tide raises all sh all ships, mm -hmm. and regardless of the size of the ship, it's still going to rise. Yeah. But for some people, for some reason, people are flinging arrows at the other ships. Like, oh, you're you're not big enough. You you got a hole in you. You're not floating hard enough, and try to shoot it down and sink it. Yeah. 
and this is something I said on the uh, Plato's Cave podcast. I did a whole little bit about where I talked to libertarian, but, but I'll say this briefly. Here's the central contradiction about libertarianism. In order to achieve the level of economic liberalization that libertarians want, where you have free markets, you have limited government, you have decentralized currencies, you have, uh, you have all of these different things, it actually requires an incredibly authoritarian government to do it. It actually requires a very heavy hand of the state to achieve what they want. Look no further than a country like Chile. Chile was a country that had elected, democratically elected, um, someone named Dr. Salvador Allende, which was the socialist leader in Chile. He was overthrown on September 11th, 1973, what Noam Chomsky calls the first 9-11. What Chile did then was install a dictator, Augusto Pinochet, who ruled for like, 15, 20 years, and they used incredibly repressive measures to achieve what they wanted to do. And in terms of the economic liberalization of people like Milton Friedman and the sort of Chicago School of Economics, the free markets, limited government, no regulations, to do that, they actually had to create an incredibly militaristic, oppressive state. Mm -hmm. And you see this in what happened to Bolivia recently where they overthrew the democratically elected socialist leader, Evo Morales, and installed this puppet, crazy right-wing Christian dictator lady, and they're repressing the native people there, right? To, to achieve the libertarianism that these, that these people want, it really does require authoritarianism, which is why I say to people that libertarianism is not much of a step from fascism. It really isn't. It, no, I agree. And, and even there, there's even so many contradictions that exists within libertarianism like it's for example modern problems make libertarianism almost impossible like if we all if we all if we all have our own individual plots of land like you've got your square mile i've got my square mile and all of a sudden i do something on my land that you know fucks up your land who's going to enforce that you know (laughs) like most libertarians they will never ever explicitly say this but most American libertarians, the ideal political and economic situation they would want is the slave aristocracy before the Civil War. Mm. That is basically it. There was a writer, there's a writer, uh, a libertarian pantheon, is a guy named Murray Rothbard, who was sort of what they called a paleo libertarian. And that was basically the argument he made. He said America was at its best when Jackson was president in the 1830s. Wow. Okay. And. Uh, like in terms of economic freedom and individualism and, and limited government and all that, like we mm-hmm. need to return to that. Well, the little thing that he leaves out there is that there were millions of enslaved African Americans. Yeah. I mean, like, economic freedom for whom? <laughs> exactly, right? And that's the question, is it's freedom for whom? Freedom for whom and freedom for what? Because mm-hmm. they don't they don't really line that out. And the thing is, it's that libertarianism is just a grift for corporate interests. If you look at the people who prop up libertarianism in this country, whether it's the Cato Institute, the Institute for Humane Studies at George Mason University, uh, Learn Liberty, all these things. Even even Prager University. Prager University, right? (laughs) These people are flush Uh with cash. Mm -hmm. Flush with cash. Most of which is coming from people like the Koch brothers, or the Koch brother, one of them is dead. Um, But the Koch brothers or people like the Simons um, who have the mall empire, you know, their, their corporate interests, follow the money, just follow the money and you'll figure it out. Mm-hmm. Before I became a Marxist, I was a libertarian. I, I, was a, I was in the libertarian movement in college. I was very in Ayn Rand, I was very into libertarianism. I joined Students for Liberty when I was in college mm. and I left it because of really two things. One was that there is what I said earlier about sort of there's a lot of neo-confederate bullshit Mm -hmm. um, where a lot of people they will never explicitly say it but the ideal social system they would like to live in is pre-civil war pre-civil war aristocratic south that's really what they want Mm -hmm. the second thing is that if you really look at all of those institutions whether it's students for liberty Cato they're all funded by people with a shit ton of money who run big evil corporations like that's it's all just like You know, it's it's the Cato, you know, it, it's the Coke, Coke Industries, it's mm-hmm. Exxon Mobil, it's all of it, right? And all of these think tanks exist because the professoriate 
was of the left 50 years ago. And then, and the right, because it really didn't have any play within the universities anymore outside of the business school, um, they set up their own alternative ecosystem of thought. Set up their underground that yeah. just continued to grow. And so now they it's set up no longer changes. underground, yeah. And that's no longer underground, right? And this is where I think the left could really learn from what the right did over the last 50, 60 years. There's a lot to learn because, ironically enough, a lot of the tactics that the right, the extreme right in this country used to gain power they were actually from Lenin. <laughs> oh. It's it's like right wing Leninism. There was a discussion I heard recently in a, uh, uh, about right wing Leninism. It's basically creating this elite cadre of individuals who can then disseminate ideas to the masses. Right. Mm -hmm. That was Lenin's conception was that like to to achieve the working class revolution. We have this elite cadre of figures who will lead the proletariat to the revolution. And that same kind of tactic was used by the extreme right in America to achieve its goals. They're incredibly, they are incredibly influenced by uh, Lenin. So it's like, hey guys, maybe we should read Lenin too and like, like actually get back into learning about how to achieve some of what the right has done by relearning what they've done, which they stole <laughs> from leftists 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. So and, yeah. And I what's, mean, what's really interesting is, is that because it was so underground for so long, mm -hmm. it had the opportunity to really cut its teeth and formulate its rhetoric in such a way yes. where th the right wing has such a control over rhetoric now that the left just does not have. Like, no, th there's we, we have no rhetorical force behind anything that we say. And it, it, yeah, it, it's always swing and a miss because the right wing, the right wing rhetoric is just so strong. They're so good at framing the debate. This is one of George Lakoff's great insights. He's a linguist who's written a couple books about political speech. Um, um, he wrote a book called uh, Moral Politics. Yeah, Maybe? Moral Politics, yeah. yeah. yeah and then but... he wrote one, re the newest, the one that really influenced me a lot when I was younger that I read in middle school was called Don't Think of an Elephant, which is a really great short little book about sort of mm. political framing and how to discuss things. So my view on this is a little controversial because I don't, I don't tow the very, at least I don't think I tow the traditional line. So here's my, here's my take on this. I think the reason why the left doesn't tend to win rhetorical battles is because they're obsessed with shibboleths. And this is a term I get from Matt Chrisman from Chapo Trap House. I love Chapo. Okay. Chrisman talks about how the biggest problem with the modern left in America is that they're obsessed with terminology and correct language. And if you don't say all of the right things in the right ways, you don't you you don't get to be a part of the group. And we're not or a big enough tent precisely because we use very specific language that no one understands. Or it, it's, do, it's essentially it's essentially giving more weight to the means and at the expense of the ends. Yes. Instead of yes. Yeah. The the left in this country has no sense of end game, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that for decades we basically uh, accepted our defeat mm. and and we realized like we're never going to win so the only thing that we can we can never real win material battles so the only thing we can genuinely win are the cultural battles mm. well we've won some of the cultural battles but the problem is is that yeah. for every cultural battle you win there's a cultural retreat for every obama there's a trump and yeah. like that you know for every you know for every cultural gain there is a cultural loss because the right is very organized right when you organize everything around cultural and identitarian lines, you lose sense of the class dynamic. This is why a lot of working class people, and I'm not just talking white working class people, I'm talking multiracial working class people, don't buy the sort of woke politics of the liberal left. They don't. Because again, it's about these like you have to say the right words and the right phrases or you're or you're not a proper person. You're not mm -hmm. you're not a part of the group. What Bernie Sanders was really good at doing was broadening a multiracial working class movement by not only really doing the, the good work of like of like centering race and centering gender and centering uh, oppressed peoples. Mm -hmm. Right. Great. Right. He centered all of those. He did not negate them. No matter what people on MSNBC said, say, he centered those, but he also centered class. And that was the unifying aspect 
because that's the, that, that is the tie that binds. And all of those oppressed identities are things we should fight for. As socialists, mm -hmm. we should always fight for, and we should always have them at the forefront of our discussion. But we always have to center class too, because class is the glue that will pull, hold the movement together. Because no matter if you're gay or straight or black or white or male or female, you are being fucked by the boss. Mm -hmm. And everybody knows what it's like to be fucked by the boss. Well, and this, so this is why you've got your your lower class working white Americans who have locked lockstep with uh, with conservative rhetoric and how they're they're anti anti race baiting that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, they're they're locked into that race rhetoric of uh, of the blacks are just more more criminal than we are, uh, and they've completely lost the the sight that class binds them all. Because they're hating everyone else around them, mm -hmm. because they they blocked into that rhetoric. Because the central the central political force of modern American life is culture. We don't talk about mm -hmm. class. We don't talk about economic material issues. We just don't. The, the the liberals and the conservatives fight all the time over the cultural shit. Because at the end of the day, the vast majority of of big picture stuff they actually agree with. This is why, like, Nancy Pelosi will wear a fucking kente cloth and look ridiculous, or she'll rip up Trump's speech, but then she'll authorize his military budget. She'll yep. give him his trade deal. She'll mm -hmm. reauthorize the Patriot Act to give him un unlimited powers to surveil people. Th look at how weak and feckless the Democratic Party has been over the last two or three years. And it will go to show you that, that that's, not, that's not by accident. It's by design. That... The, these people will always use cultural issues as a wedge to, to negate real class interests. Now, I know that some people listening to this will accuse me of class reductionism. That's not at all what I'm getting at. I'm saying, I will say it again. I am not negating the incredible and the important value variables of race and gender and, and, and other marginalized identities, the disabled. I'm not negating any of that. It just can't be done alone. You know, but there has to be a class analysis. You have to tie all of those together. The 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 thing that will bind all of those together mm -hmm. in a in a movement that works is class analysis. And well, like because you said most, earlier, the, the yeah. intersectionality, yes, and binding binding it all together. You have to bind it together, and and class is the glue that holds it all together because that's the uniting force. And. That's the thing I think that we need to get better at doing. And Bernie Sanders' movement was really good at this. And I think that in a, in a different scenario, like if COVID not had happened, I really think there was a shot he could have won because he would have destroyed Trump in the general election. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's no way. He would have destroyed Trump in 2016 and he would have destroyed him now because Bernie Sanders is a real populist. Mm -hmm. Trump is a fake populist. He will use fake populism but when he gets into power, he sides with Wall Street, he sides with Goldman Sachs, he gives them their tax cuts, he gives them their trade deals, he gives them everything they want, right? Bernie Sanders is not that guy. He's a different kind he's a different cat. He's a different kind of cat, man. Yeah. Like he's just a different and so Trump is essentially a, a corporatist in populist skin. Absolutely. Absolutely. Whereas Sanders is the real deal. And people saw yeah. that. And Bernie got all of those great gains without losing any ground on on issues of uh, on intersectional issues because what he was building was a truly multiracial working class movement mm -hmm. the vast majority of his campaign staffers were people of color a very large percentage of them, of them were women you know it was an incredibly diverse campaign it was an incredibly diverse speaking roster mm -hmm. you know it was an incredibly united multiracial movement and that's what we need is a multiracial working class movement to take America back from the corporate fuckers who've been screwing us for the last four decades. And he got roadblocked every step of the way because yeah. mainstream Democratic Party is their corporatist as well. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. what's so funny is that the Democratic Party is so shit. They're, <laughs> most of the time, they vacillate between either being completely worthless or being completely idiotic. They're, they're, it's almost like they're, you know, but it's so funny, like they, 
they fall ass backwards into failure more often than not. Like the Democratic Party are professional losers. That they've they've been that way for two or three decades now. Especially during the Obama era, they've become professional mm -hmm. losers. Um, and you know when it comes to them, I mean the big problem is that like, and I'm I'm with other people who say this like the Democratic Party needs a Tea Party. It needs we need the. What happened to the, to the Republicans with the Tea Party is something that we need to do now. Mm. We need to primary people. We need to get people out, right? So you have the wonderful win of uh, Jamal Bowman in New York taking out one of the most sleaziest, nastiest Democratic politicians, Elliot Engel, total fucking scumbag. He's out of there now, right? Uh, Charlie, I think his name's Charlie Booker, who almost won in, Ken in, oh, in Kentucky. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, against Amy McGrath, another shitbag neoliberal CIA puppet. Like, you know, she's going to get her ass kicked to McConnell. If it had been Booker, Booker would have had a fighting chance. Mm. Because here's the thing about retail politics that's really important. If you offer people a choice between Republican and Republican light, nine times out of ten, they will just choose the Republican. Because here's the thing about the Republican Party. They actually have convictions. They're horrible, but mm -hmm. they actually have. Democrats don't believe in anything. They are willing to be all things to all people while believing in nothing. That's why they lose. Yeah. There's there's a whole lot of group cohesion among the Republicans in general. Yeah. And even if there are minor disparities here and there, they can center around their, their core values, which are shit, but their core values regardless. Yep. Whereas and ours, we're celebrating the diversity among ourselves and not centering on anything because the democratic party has basically become its constituent is basically what is called the pmc or the professional managerial class that's their constituency these are upper middle class white people right that's i think it's really important they're like mm -hmm. look at how joe biden's running his campaign yep. he's basically said i could give a shit if the hispanics vote for me I could, you know, if Hispanics mm -hmm. vote for me, I could give a shit. You said it to people's faces. Well, I'll go vote for somebody else then. You know, I could like, give a shit if these other people vote for me. So it's really funny that, like, the Democratic Party who talks all the time about how, like, we need to prop up marginal voices nominated a dude who could give a fuck about any of that. Yep. It just goes to show you that they really don't care about this shit, that they've co-opted it for their own purposes. Yep. Don't let neoliberals co-opt um, true... Uh, interesting anti-racist politics like don't let them do it because it's getting close to that and we're in a really bad place like don't let these corporate neoliberal assholes take over the multiracial working class movement we're trying to build like we lines need to be drawn in the sand that's why like you know people need to support shahid buttar's race in california yeah, against nancy yeah. pelosi mm -hmm. you know that's why people should have supported um uh uh i forget his name uh Lee out in Oregon or Washington who was running against a really crappy Democrat. Uh -oh. That's why people should support Ed Markey for U.S. Senate over Joe Kennedy the third. Seriously, Joe Kennedy the third is is a piece of shit centrist corporate asshole. Don't vote for him. Ed Markey supports the Green New Deal. Ed Markey is one of the co-sponsors of the Green New Deal. He's one of the most progressive uh, uh, senators in the country. He's ten times better than Joe Kennedy. Don't let that that ugly looking ginger win that election. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, that was mean. That was able. I'm sorry. That was that was. I should. But anyway, like it gets yeah. me hot because he sucks and like people should know that. But he's taken pharma money. Like, yeah. but yeah, like there needs to be a purge. And like the problem is, is that like the the Freedom Caucus in the House that was really like tough during the Obama era about like budgets and all that kind of shit. They would hold the Republican Party hostage. The reason they did that was because the Freedom Caucus was made up of like 20 House members. And that 20 House members were ideologically pure. They were united, right, in their sort of Tea Party beliefs. Mm -hmm. The Progressive Caucus for the Democrats there needs to no be – there is no cohesion because you have some people in the Progressive Caucus who are also in the New Democratic Caucus, which is the Centrist Caucus. Like, no. <laughs> If you you either belong to one or the other, you don't get to be in both. Like the Progressive Caucus should really become like 20, 25 members of the of the uh, and, and should hold the party hostage. I, I, I because that's how you change it. Like I'm like this whole idea that politics works as some like West Wing bullshit 
or if you just sit people in a room and you're polite with one another and and oh well that's reasonable i'll take your position that's horseshit yeah politics no. is about power it's about fighting for it you have to fight for something i mean that that's why the left has lost so much ground over the obama administration because they they were too worried about being polite they were too worried about the means than they were about the ends Yes, they were so obsessed with process, and that's mm -hmm. one of the biggest problems with neoliberal Democrats. They are so obsessed with process. If you need any indication of the of the just the bat shittery of that kind of thinking, it's all over Vox.com. That's Vox mm -hmm. in a nutshell, right? Like here is our 52-page essay on how we get to universal health care through 15 different grant programs, 32 yeah. states. Like it's this, they have this obsession with technicalities and technocracy. Mm -hmm. That's why people like that loved Elizabeth Warren because Elizabeth Warren was the techni technocratic queen. She mm -hmm. was obsessed with like plans and technical shit. It's like, here's the thing, retail politics 101. Don't tell people how complicated something is because they won't buy it, uh, right? Uh, why was Bernie so successful? Medicare for all, very simple. No deductibles, no copays, no premiums. You pay a little more taxes, but you save a lot. You save a lot more money, and the country saves a lot more money. Mm -hmm. It's fucking simple. It's simple. A single payer, free at the point of service. Boom. What was her plan? Well, first it was Medicare for all, <laughs> and then it was this like bullshit like two-step program where it's basically the public option in Obamacare. Mm -hmm. Because here's the thing. Like this is the other thing too. These these people are just they're they're terrible at this. Here's the thing. If you're a negotiating table. Right. What you want to do is you want to go in with the hardline position so that if you do end up making a compromise, it's better than what you would have gotten. Otherwise, mm -hmm. the problem is Democrats always show up with the shitty compromise position as their hardline yeah. position in hand. Yeah. In hand. And they say, please, please give it to me. They're wimps. They're cowards. Mm -hmm. You know, Lyndon Johnson was not a perfect politician, but I'll tell you what. The Democratic Party needs to gain back a little bit more of its mojo that it had during the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and 60s. Mm -hmm. Like, that sense of, like, you know, but without the Southern racism. Like, let's like, like get the Southern racist Democrats out of the fold, mm -hmm. but keep that sense of, like, you know, you're going to give me what I want or I'm going to hold your balls in a noose. Like, there, there, there has to be some sense of that because politics is a war. And it's us versus them. Like, stop mm -hmm. believing I mean, that you're well, that you can... when when the them is telling Obama straight up, we're not going to implement any of the judges that you that you bring to the table. We're just not going to do it. It doesn't matter yeah. who it is. We're not going to do it. And they they had Obama's balls in the vice. Yeah, and we don't even have the stones to return the favor because and we're too Obama worried about asked, process. Yeah. And all Obama ever asked them to do was just loosen up a little bit. Mm -hmm. That's all I ever asked for. Mm -hmm. And mind you, like, there's a lot of gains that happened to the Obama era. Like, the Affordable Care Act is a true achievement. There's a lot about it that's very good. The stuff about the Affordable Care Act that's the best stuff is the universal stuff. Mm -hmm. We have to advocate for universal programs. We have to stop doing this, like, you know, technocratic Elizabeth Warren bullshit of, like, we're all means tested. So it's like, um, if you went to this college in this county during these years and you made this amount of income and you hired this many amount of people, you'll get this amount of tax credits. Like, fuck that shit. People hate that shit, okay? Because first off, it never benefits regular people. It always benefits people who have the money to game the system, who can buy a team of lawyers to figure out the regulations, right? So, like, make it simple. Like, the Affordable Care Act's best parts were the banning of lifetime caps on care. The banning of of, of uh, restrictions against people with pre-existing conditions, of mm -hmm. which I am one. You know, the Medicaid expansion, which was the best part of that fucking law. The shit about Obamacare that sucks is the neoliberal corporate crap. It's yep. the marketplace. It's mm -hmm. the individual mandate. That's the stuff that sucks. You know, it was Bob Dole's health plan. Obamacare was Bob Dole, Mr. Conservative Bob Dole, who ran yep. against yep. Bill Clinton in 1996. Bob Dole's health care plan in 1996 when he ran against Bill Clinton was Obamacare. Obamacare was basically cooked up by the Heritage Foundation. It's not it's not this like socialist plot to take over America. No, it's an incredibly it, it pro corporate, right from... pro market solution. <laughs> and no and it's no surprise that like the universal parts of the law work really well and people yeah. like that. And, and the market the, ones don't. And the market ones don't. Because maybe we shouldn't treat healthcare like a commodity. I mean, it's like, but that's the problem is that like, 
Obama, there were so many things Obama could have done that he didn't. He should have prosecuted the banks. He should have gone after the bankers. Bankers should have been put in jail they like, really after have. the financial crisis. People should have been thrown in jail. He should have gone after the Bush administration for war crimes, and he didn't do that. He should have passed the Enfor Employee Free Choice Act or card check for unions to expand union unionization in this country. He didn't do that. He had, he had a supermajority in the House and Senate. He didn't do any of this shit. I mean, that's, and he had all of the leverage. Uh huh. That's, but that's the problem is that, like, Democrats in this era, they act like such wimps. Like, you need to learn something from the Republicans. They're cocky as hell. You need to get a little bit of that swagger. You need to act mm -hmm. like you got a big swing and dick. Like, you have to have some level of energy I mean, because they, otherwise. They had the charisma, but they didn't have the stones to back it up. Absolutely. And like yep. that's part of the reason why people hate like Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi, because they're these wimpy, feckless old fuckers like that. People don't like them. I don't like Nancy Pelosi. I don't like Chuck Schumer. I don't like Steny Hoyer. All like. these people suck. Like they're terrible. Like it's first off, they're old as shit. They won't go away. That's one of the problems. Mm -hmm. Nancy Pelosi's like 78. She's also worth one hundred million dollars. So you think she can actually think about class interests, please? <laughs> blow me like there, none of that's ever going to happen so like we have to start fighting fire with fire which is why it's so important like the the jabal bowman win in new york is so important the near win in kentucky is so important booker would have won that race in kentucky if if kentucky hadn't closed the polling places he would have won it he raised like seven hundred thousand dollars that was like his campaign budget amy mcgrath spent like 40 million to win that seat and she's going to get her ass kicked by Mitch McConnell anyway. So it's like, this is this is just the big stuff, man. Like, we just have to start fighting for something. We can't just be in opposition to Republicans anymore. We mm -hmm. have to actually, like, and we have to stop treating every Republican who comes along as the most evil thing ever. You know? I remember when Mitt Romney was running against Obama, and we talked about how well, Mitt Romney is going to be the worst thing ever. He's terrible. He's terrible. Now look at him. the worst thing ever. Now look at him. And now up. Trump is. And it's Trump. <laughs> Trump is the worst thing ever. And then in eight years, when Todd Cotton is a pre is, oh, is, is, is Lord Protector of the fascist <laughs> United States, <laughs> you know, people will talk about, like, people are, like, you have liberals who are rehabilitating George W. Bush's reputation. Yeah. Really? Like, His like, reputation is, is not anything to, to reinvigorate whatsoever. That dude did war crimes. And I will I will argue right now, based on the track record, I'm sorry, the Bush presidency was worse. Yeah. The Bush presidency was worse. You can say what you want about Trump. Trump is horrid. There are some things that Trump is certainly worse about than George W. Bush was. Mm -hmm. But the but Trump didn't get us into a decades long war over a fucking lie that mm -hmm. led to a debt to the deaths of thousands of American soldiers, trillions of dollars. And the deaths of nearly a million Iraqis. Like, I'm sorry, the Bush administration should be tried for war crimes. They are war criminals. Like, stop rehabilitating war criminals. You know, I don't care if Dick Cheney puts on a mask. I don't care. <laughs> He's still a war criminal. Still a war criminal. So it's like, so it's like we just have to stop with this like co-opting. But that's why I'm not a liberal. I'm a leftist. I'm a socialist. It's because liberals and conservatives are actually a lot more alike than they are different. What they fight over is the cultural bullshit. But when it comes to like unlimited war, tax cuts for the wealthy, and, conti board, and, and continued the corporatization of the American state, they all agree with each other. Mm -hmm. They're all in a very elite club. And guess what? We're not in it. Well, I think this is a, a good place to end now that yeah. we've been on a hot streak for the last 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah, I know. We went a little bit over, but yeah, I mean, I think it's important to also end on a hopeful note, which is that yeah. like things are changing. Like the American left is being revived and like there is it a is. real sense of momentum and that we need to build in that momentum and like build not just one Bernie Sanders, but like hundreds of Bernie Sanderses. I, you know, I'm, I'm really hopeful for the progressive movement. The more and more I see of it. And the more and more I see progressive candidates actually getting maybe not an actual seat, but at least have a, a more of a foothold than they would have gotten 10 years ago. You know? Absolutely. There's a lot that's, to be hopeful for. That's hopeful. That's There's hopeful. a lot to be hopeful for. And I can tell you right now that, like, the future of the Democratic Party is Bernie Sanders. It's not Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. no, matter, no matter how popular Obama is now, the future of the party is him. And the, his ideas. That's where the party is. If they want to be a party 
that has generational power, that does transformative change for America, they will leave behind the Clinton third way politics and they will embrace the politics of Bernie Sanders. Mm -hmm. So, well, to, to end on a, a lighter note, yeah, uh, a, a couple months ago, you, you wrote a piece, not on your main blog site, but you wrote a piece on puzzles. Yeah. And gaming and their link to the community. Yeah. And, which, which was a really nice piece. It was light, right? Thank but you. my, my, uh, my question about this piece is within that you, you had a lot of great captions that you had or great screen caps you had dug out of the archives mm -hmm. and i'm imagining you have a lot of access to archival records yes and, yeah. and my my question is what is one of the the oddest things that you've come across looking through archival imagery that oh, just made you go either hey that's really awesome or hey what the fuck is happening here like what, what's the odd stuff that's a great question so my current job is I'm digital initiatives director for the Indiana Historical Bureau, um, which is in the Indiana State Library. So I run digital initiatives. The, the, the clippings that you saw in that article were from Hoosier State Chronicles, which is our um, Indiana statewide digital historical news pro newspaper program. It's 1.2 million pages um, of historical newspapers going all the way back to 1805 up to about 2011. Wow. And uh, so over 200 years of Indiana history and then some. And uh, so... In terms of interesting things, I mean, and before that, I was the communications director for the state archives. At the state archives, there's all kinds of weird shit. So, like, <laughs> I've seen uh, the original trademark application for the logo of the Indiana Pacers, oh. um, which we have in our in our in our, our which we had at the U archives. Um, I've seen some really dark shit. So, uh, I've seen mug shots. Uh, we have state mugshot records that were at the archives. Um, and then at the state library, some of the more interesting things that we have are, um, one I wrote about in my master's thesis, there was this newspaper in Indianapolis called the Iconoclast, which was a free thought magazine. It was a, it was a magazine devoted to agnostics and free thinkers. And it republished a lot of material of Robert Ingersoll, who was this late 19th century orator who I've yeah. written my, yeah. I've written about, um, extensively. And uh, it was published by a guy named W.H. Lemaster. And he, uh, and he, and we still have it. It's, you know, we have a few extant issues. It only ran for three or four years. Um, they're not in the best shape, but they're there and they're great. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that they published was a series of answers that Robert Ingersoll had given to members of d different members of the clergy. So they would ask him, like, do you believe in a beginning or the end of the universe? What do you think about Jesus? This kind of stuff. And he would give them answers. Um, and so they published Ingersoll's answers to that. Um, in terms of like dark things, like really dark things, the state archives has the original organizing charter for the, um, for the Evansville Ku Klux Klan. Oh, boy. Okay. So in Indiana, the Klan was really, really big in the 19-teens mm -hmm. and 20s. Um, the, too. Yeah. Yeah. The national, yeah. I think the national headquarters was here back back in the 1920s during what they call the second wave of the Klan. Mm -hmm. um, and the organizing document is signed by a man named D.C. Stevenson, who basically ran Indiana politics during the 1920s. He was basically a party boss. Think of like Karl Rove, but a Klansman. That was what he was in Indiana. Oh, okay. Um, and he basically elected a Klan governor. There was a Klan legislature, and there was a Klan mayor of Indianapolis, and there were Klan uh, and there were Klan city offices. And this is in the mid 1920s. Uh, Stevenson would eventually go to prison for the uh, the rape and murder of a young woman. So that's a pretty dark document. Yeah. That's a pretty weird one. I'll try to go with some more hopeful stuff. Um, we have, uh, in, in terms of stuff at the state library, I mean, one of the cooler things that we have is, um, the Indianapolis times. This is a great a counterpoint to the thing I just said. So the Indianapolis times is the latest project that we've digitized. It's, um, a wonderful daily newspaper that ran in the city. There were three major papers at one time. There was the star, the news and the times mm -hmm. and the times ran from the, like 1914 to 1965, somewhere around that. Oh, so quite a while. We, 
quite a while. So we we digitized 1920 to 1952, and that's now available freely online for anybody to use. Daily. The, daily. Wow. A, it was a daily newspaper. So we're talking upwards of 265,000 plus pages wow. of material spanning 32 years. The Times won the Pulitzer Prize in 1928 for exposing the Klan in the state. They were the ones who went after Stevenson. They were the ones who took his political empire down. Um, they published articles basically laying out how he was giving hush money payments to the governor. Um, and then the governor ended up resigning, uh, not resigning, but ended up leaving office in disgrace. So they did the investigative journalistic expose. Yep, exposing they did. The whole thing, yeah. They did the really tough work of really taking down the Klan and, and won the Pulitzer Prize for it. So that's something that I'm really that's proud awesome. we've worked on. Yeah. They were a great crusading newspaper. Um, I know I said, I know you asked weird stuff, but um, there, I mean, but in terms of like, those are just some of the more things that I'm proud of. But there's a lot of weird things, but you know, it's, and then Indiana Memory, which is the other digital um, program I run. Uh, Indiana Memory's got a lot of cool, interesting stuff in it too. Um, so. I definitely check that out. Uh, we have a lot of the um, the Indiana Indianapolis 500 uh, 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 parades. We have pictures of some of the floats from those parades going back, I think, to like the 1980s. So that's kind of an interesting yeah. thing. Um, and then we uh, we have some territorial papers that go all the way back to the 1800s, uh, early 1800s. So there's a lot of cool stuff and. You know, all this, again, is freely available for people to use. All you have to do is just type in, like, Hoosier State Chronicles or Indiana Memory on Google, and it'll pop right up. You can do as much research as you want. So it's essentially like the Indiana State version of the Internet Archives. Pretty much, yeah. 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 And we actually have stuff in the Internet Archive, too. So you can oh, check okay. us out on the Indiana Archive. And the Internet Archive as well. We're all over the map. Um, Indiana Memory is an aggregator of stuff from all over the state. So we not only have materials that we've digitized, but we have stuff that's been digitized all across the state. Awesome. Yeah, well, it's fun. Justin, th thanks so much for this, man. This was this was <laughs> a fun first entry into to this sort of thing. I mean, I couldn't have asked for a better conversation. This was awesome. Oh, it's been beyond my pleasure, Brad. Thank you so much yeah. for, for giving me the time. And I know we went a little over. I tend to be long winded. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it bothers me none. So <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having yeah, me on. You and, so uh, you know, maybe we can do it again soon. Absolutely. I'll, I'll have you on any time. All right. Take care. All right. Man. See you, Justin. See ya.